I'm good? Yeah. yeah. I can go? Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to this workshop on JavaScript patterns. So just to give a short intro, uh, I'm Lydia Halley. I'm a staff developer advocate at Vercel. Uh, and in my free time, I really enjoy like writing technical articles, especially about JavaScript, uh, or just any like creative content, uh, especially using animations. I feel like it's easier to kind of grasp like what's going on under the hood when I can actually see what's happening. Um, and back in 2020, I collaborated with Adi Osmani. Uh, he's an engineering manager at Google on a project called JavaScript Patterns, or Patterns. Uh, and this was based on a book that he published back in 2012. Um, and I don't know if some of you have read the book. It's an amazing book. And the patterns that he covered are extremely good. However, as you might imagine, back in 2012, the syntax used to be pretty different compared to what it is now. Um, so he reached out to me and asked if I wanted to collaborate with him on a new project, or like covering the patterns from a modern perspective using ES15. Uh, and not just the design patterns that he covers, but also using React patterns, performance patterns, and rendering patterns. So that's what I'm here for today. Uh, I'm going to cover design patterns, uh, React patterns, performance patterns, and rendering patterns. Uh, and for this workshop, I've created a website. Uh, you can actually find that on javascriptpatterns.vercel.app. And this is what I'll be working with, uh, or at least working, working from. Uh, and for, or you will see like all the stuff that we'll be covering today. Um, and for the exercises, I'm using Stack Blitz. Now you don't need to have an account for that, which is pretty nice. I just didn't want to have to deal with like the environment setup, all of that stuff. Um, so when you're doing an exercise and you want to get it on a bigger screen, just to quickly show you, you can just click on here and you will actually see it open up um, a bit bigger, bigger font size and all that stuff. Cool. Any questions so far? No? All right, let's get started. First with design patterns. So design patterns are concepts that we can use to like solve, or at least solve in a performant way, like commonly recurring issues in software architecture. Um, now, before I get started with all the patterns that we'll be covering today, they aren't just like a checklist. It's not like, oh, these are the patterns that will make your app performance, so just implement this in your app right away. That's not how it works. Um, I'm just here kind of to like raise awareness, like, hey, these patterns exist. These are commonly recurring uh, issues or like minor problems that might affect your app's performance pretty badly. Um, so maybe in the future, if you ever run into an issue with your sub architecture, you're like, hey, wait a second, like I've learned this, I've heard about this issue. I believe I can use this pattern to solve this. Um, cool. So first, so I'll be covering seven patterns here, uh, or six, I guess it is. So we've got the module, singleton, proxy, observer, vectory, and prototype. So the first one is the module pattern. Let me just start this real quick. Now, if you've been using JavaScript only pretty recent, the module pattern might be a little bit weird to you, because you're like, isn't it obvious that we can use modules in, in JavaScript? Uh, but actually, it's only ever since ES15 that they introduced uh, like built-in modules. Because it used to be pretty common to just you know, write JavaScript in one big file uh, and then execute that entire file. I'm just going to scroll down here. Um, for example, this used to be a pretty like common like HTML code. You know, like we can import the math script and the index uh, script. So math contained like these types of functions. I'm actually just going to open it up in the thing to make it a bit bigger. Ooh. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So the uh, math here contained like sub, multiply, subtract, and divide functions. And the index is can like instantly use it because we're importing math here uh, before index. So this script had like access to all the properties that were defined on math. Like we can see that on like the window, we can have like window dot multiply, and this would actually show that function because JavaScript didn't really have the idea of encapsulation, private v uh, values, variables, all that stuff. Now, as you might imagine, this could actually quickly run, or you can quickly run into some issues here uh, if you like don't want to expose certain values. So this is why the module pattern, or with the module pattern, we can, well, A, we can split like a bigger file up into more, more, or multiple pieces and only export the functions or like make the uh, parts public that we actually want to make public, or like we can export the function that we want to make public. Um, so besides that, we can also like split larger files into more reusable pieces. So we can like reuse modules all throughout our application. 
the good thing about this is that if we don't like intentionally export a value, they will be private. They're encapsulated to just that module. So we can use the module pattern in multiple ways. Either in HTML, we can add the type module to the uh, script attribute, which immediately like encapsulates that module. So whereas here, actually I'll just go back you see that it used to say like sum is three. Ah, it keeps on playing. OK, wait, that's what it's going to do. Like sum is three, because it, it used to have access to that math module as they were loaded like sequentially. Right now, if we make it a module, that uh, math, um, all, all the functions within the math module are encapsulated to just that module. Uh, so you can see that here. Oh, yeah, so here we're like exporting these values again, um, and we can import it back. Or we only have to like import the index now, because index is actually importing all of these uh, within the file itself. In Node, it's a bit different. In Node, we can either use the MGS extension, which I personally prefer, because it, it just makes it very clear, like, hey, this is a module. This isn't a normal script. Or we can add it by using the type module to our package.json. Um, so we can see that here. Like, we add the type module, and then we can import it here. So when you run node, node index. So if I didn't do that, it will actually throw an error. I'm just going to show you. Oop. Yeah, so here it says I cannot use an import statement outside of a module because this is like module specific syntax. Now, yeah, like I said, the module pattern is extremely nice for encapsulation because we can have like both public values or expose certain values by exporting them explicitly, but we can also keep other values private by simply not exporting them. Uh, and then, of course, there's the reusability aspect of it because we can just have one module and import them into in multiple files. OK, we're already going to start with our first challenge. So if you scroll down here, you can see the challenge. So this code here is just one big index.js file. And I want you to split this up into the math.js that includes all the math-specific functions, uh, and then import them back in index.js. And if you just want to see the solution, that's also down here. But I won't be showing that just yet. All right, we'll take uh, about five minutes or what? Yeah, there's like five minutes.
Sure. <clears throat> All right. Did you guys figure it out? Done? Cool. So just to walk you through the solution. So the very first thing that we first have to do is create another file called math.js. Uh, can we uh, open oh. that in? Oh, yeah, of course. Sorry, Sorry about that. OK, I'm just going to fork it real quick so I'm not. So first create another file called math.js. Change everything or move everything here. Export them because we want to use them in our index.js file. So we need to explicitly add the export keyword to make them public or at least available in other modules. You can import them. Sum, subtract, divide, multiply from math.js. And then the last step that I always forget, type module. Or we could have used the MJS extension. So now with this, we can use it. So now it's also easier to show you that if we added like a secret value here, like, I don't know, const secret equals AB, or yeah, one, two, three, that's fine too. Um, and we wanted to like import that, it will throw an error. Um, because the requested module doesn't provide that named export secret. So this is a really good way to keep secret encapsulated to just that module, because the function inside it can, of course, use secret. We can have a function that returns secret from the module that would then expose it. Um, but we cannot just import anything that hasn't been exported. Cool. Well, that was the module pattern so far. One other thing about modules is that they are, by default, singletons. And that's actually the next pattern that we're going to cover, the singleton pattern. So with singletons, we can share a global instance, and it's also always a single instance. Um, for example, here we like this is just kind of a visualization of the of the counter singleton. Um, whenever we have a class and we want to make sure that there's only ever one instance, we can use a singleton. Oh, sorry, before we get into singleton, there's a question from chat. Sure. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, between the exercises. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure that people's questions are answered. Um, so, if the browser supports ESX modules by adding the type module attribute, why do we need to use module bundler bundlers for bundling our dependencies in one or multiple files? Well, the fact that it's a module doesn't mean that it contains all the files that we use. So, normally with like a mo module bundler. What they also do is they make sure that if we're requesting another module, maybe a note module, which is also a great thing that we could use now, is that they're all within that one file, all bundled within that um, file that we request. Um, like if we wanted to import, say, a note module, and we're just using that in a script, maybe I can show you. Um, I'll just go back to, I guess, here. I guess I didn't save the solution. But um, if, actually, I will probably do this one, because this one had the HTML. Uh, like, we can, of course, say that, OK, index.js is of type module. And in here, it is nice, because we're like importing math.js. But if we wanted to import, say, a node module that was, I don't know, in our package, or we added, like, uh, import, uh, OK, I, haven't had, I don't have any node modules here. but. Uh, I don't know, calendar from calendar. Somehow we have like a calendar note module. By default, like the browser doesn't know what calendar is. It doesn't know what to fetch it from. So normally a bundler makes sure that it goes through all the imports, makes sure that it bundles them. It gets that code that we're using, bundles them into that one bundle. We'll also cover this later, by the way, um, how like bundlers work and how we can use them with modules. Um, but yeah, so a bundler just makes sure that everything is available to the browser when it's actually being requested. But yeah, like I said, we will cover this later as well. So maybe that will also clear some uh, some questions there. Awesome. Cool. Then we'll have to restart a singleton. Sorry. Oh, no worries. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Good. OK. So next is the singleton pattern. And the with or a singleton is basically a single instance that can be shared throughout the entire application. Um, normally, when we have like classes, maybe like this counter class, uh, we could either export it like as a class and then instantiate a new counter um, whenever we import uh, import it in a file, but we usually don't want this. So with a singleton, what we can use or what we can do is ensure that there's only like that single instance that can be used throughout our application. So here, for example, we have file one. I should just make this big. We can have file one that imports the counter, the singleton. It increments it. You can see the increment already counts going up. 
And it continues to do that when we increment it in other files as well, because they all share that single instance. So they all have that reference to the same class, to the same instance in the application. Now in EOS 6, there are several ways to create singletons. The very first one is using a class. Um, and there are a couple of things here that are very like unique to singletons. So the first thing uh, is that when we are instantiating the new counter, or like in this case, the counter class, uh, we have to make sure that an instance doesn't already exist. Because that's the thing of the singletons. Only one instance should ever exist. So if we are uh, instantiating a new one, and we do see that an instance exists, um, you know, we have like the instance variable here that we set equal to the new instance when we instantiate it, um, we would throw an error. Like, hey, you cannot do that. This is not a singleton. You can only create one instance. Then another thing about singletons is that they shouldn't be modifiable. So no file or no, no part of the application should be able to change it. Uh, it's just that class that's it. Uh, and we can do that in JavaScript with the object.freeze. That makes sure that uh, we cannot like ch or add any properties or change the properties that currently exist on, uh, on an object or a class, because classes are, of course, objects. Um, and to make sure that or we actually instantiate the new counter, so this new class as a singleton already in this file before we export it. So whenever files import it, they import the uh, instance and not the class. So they cannot like instantiate the already instantiated instance, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, we only instantiate it once, freeze it to make sure it's not modifiable. Um, however, in a lot of cases, we don't actually have to use classes anymore in ES6. We can actually just use objects. Um, now, if we have the counter example again, we can see that we can create a counter object that just has the get count method, increment, and de uh, decrement method. We can freeze it and export it. I always like to keep it pretty short. We can just instantly freeze the object that we create um, and then export it. So whenever, whenever other files import it, uh, they just have that one single object. Now, some of the trade-offs of singletons is that, of course, it's really good for, for memory, if you, if you care about that, uh, because we make sure that you know, we can only have just one single instance uh, instead of having to create memory or use memory for every one of them. Um, but there are actually also a lot of cons to the singleton pattern, especially in 2022, what it is now. Um, now, like I said, you know, ES15 modules are singletons by default. So we no longer really have to think too much about, OK, creating this or achieving this like global, non-modifiable behavior, because modules by default are already singletons. Um, then there's also stuff like dependency hiding. Maybe a singleton is importing another module, but we don't really know about that. Um, so every time that we uh, import it, we could be modifying the singleton without really knowing it. This is like dependency hiding. Um, then there's also like the testing. Uh, it's really difficult to test singletons because we change it globally. So every one small modification can lead to like the entire test suite failing, which is highly, highly annoying. And we also have to reset it every time. Uh, so that's definitely a big con to singletons. But yeah, long story short, singletons are great if you want to achieve some kind of like global state in your application. But maybe consider using a module if that works for your application as well. Now again, there's a small exercise. So this is a fake database connection class. And we want to make sure that there is only ever one single database connection. Uh, this is actually a pretty common use case for a singleton <laughs> because we don't want to just have like 100 database connections um, it, within one application. So you can see the class here, database connection. We, we have a connect and disconnect method. And we want to make sure that only one instance can ever exist. So make sure that this is a singleton, non-modifiable, and a single instance. What does the default keyword do to an export? Uh, the default? So it kind of does two things. Both we can, um, I'll just show you. I was going to fork it so I don't change the. So say I was going to default connection here. And I go to test.js. I can just do import connection from index.js. And with a, a default import, I don't have to use this in brackets. I could have actually named this anything. I could have been like database connection lol 
and it still would have mm -hmm. imported this default export. Now normally if we have maybe a named export, so anything within brackets, so like export connection, in that case I do have to explicitly say like this is named connection. Now I can still rename it to be like database connection with, um, I always forget the name of this thing, I don't know. oh as, sorry, with the as keyword. Um, but that's the biggest difference. Now actually also the default keyword, so what we're exporting here is more like, okay wait, let me just create a comment. I'm so bad at live coding, it's, it's hilarious. Okay, we can actually have like default connection and then we also have like connection here. Um, so when we're importing the default, I could also just say default, which is importing um, the default connection. Okay, I don't know if that explanation was any better. The biggest advantage of using a default export is that we don't have to think about the name which, uh, with which we're ex exporting the value. Uh, like I could have just done like database connection and if I maybe in this file already had something called database connection, I don't know, just like a private value here, then this would have resulted in like a, a naming collision. So I don't want to use that, so I either don't want to rename this import or this default uh, export, which is most likely the case because this can be anything, I can just rename it and make sure that I'm using that throughout the application or at least in this file. Um, so that's the biggest difference, it's just the way that we can import them in, in other modules. All right, we'll take a five minute break.
All right. So, ready? Yep. Yeah. We'll look at the solution in that case. Um, so the first thing that we needed to do is to add to the constructor that there can only be one single instance, like we saw before. So we have like an, an instance keyword here, and we declare that, or we set the value to the like this new instance when we declare it for the first time, when it didn't throw an error. Um, then we just have the connect method, disconnect method, and we can create a new variable here, um, database connector, which is the singleton. We freeze it, and then we in or immediately instantiate the new database connection object. So now we can like uh, export the database connector if we want in like other files and use it there. So that's really all that the singleton is doing. But of course, we could have just used a mod, or in this case, used a module here as well if we wanted to use modules in other files as well. But if you don't, then this is still a great approach uh, to use that database connector, singleton. Any questions so far? Um, Moving on to proxy. Just a quick question, or um, yeah, hi. It's more effective if you type out the solution, but I understand this is a simple exercise. So I can type it out here as well. I don't mind. Okay. 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 So from the start, we're first it's going to create a variable. Oops, sorry, just pop up. Is the instance. So by default, this does just nothing. We don't have an instance yet, hopefully. But if we do require a new one, we want to set the instance equal to the new instance that we just created. Now, if we do see that there is already an instance, when we uh, create a new instance, we just throw an error. So throw a new error. Um, you can can only create one single database connection. Then we have the connection here, but we actually just want to, it, like say we always just use the same URI, like we know what that is. So this connection can just be an object of freeze. And right now, connection is a singleton. We make sure that there's only ever one single instance, throw an error if it's not, but most likely we will never really, because we aren't exporting it, so it's not like other files can import this database connection class without the singleton now. Um, so like we can then do export default connection. So really, we would only ever see this error if within this file, we maybe say like new da database connection. But I mean, hopefully you won't do that. So yeah, database is now a singleton. Cool. Ready for the proxy pattern? So. prompt for questions first. Any questions on singletons? Oh. No. <laughs> uh, wait for the stream. And then we'll yeah. No questions? OK, we'll go. Perfect. Oh, wait, yeah, there is one. Oh. <laughs> Uh, in this case, it, we could have just uh, created an object. Um, however, since we're also like using that URI here, well, okay. So in, th in this case, this connection. Oh, actually, I will open it up. Sorry, I keep forgetting to open it up in new stack blitz. So for an uh, object, let's see what this would have looked like. Oh, cons database connection object dot freeze. So we want to have the URI here. Maybe what we could do is create a function that takes this URI. So then we have connect. URI has been connected, and we have a disconnect. So DB is disconnected. Um, and then we could just have the URI here if we want to. So now this could have could have worked. So now like the connection could be like, is database connection and then we pass the URI here, which is this MongoDB. Because this just returns an object right away. Like this is an arrow function that immediately, implicitly returns an object here. Um, so that also could have been the case. It was just easier to refactor this with the class that was already there. Um, so now we can do export default connection. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had one question. So you mentioned that um, explicitly creating singletons is less necessary now because um, now ES2015 modules are singletons by default. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit more about that? For sure. 
So for example, I'm just going to use the same uh, file that we have here. I'm just going to create like a counter. Um, so we have like count, but default is zero. Um, now if we wanted to have maybe a function that's like increment, oh, we actually want to export this. So this returns return plus plus count. So this returns the count incremented by one. And maybe we also want to have an export function decrement return minus minus count. Uh, and then also, let's just have an export. So I'm just going to create another file. I'm going to import this uh, counter module into files in that case. So file one, file two, or I'll, can just, I'll keep index here. So I'm, uh, let's see, import counter increment from counter.js. Now I can do increment increment and then log the counter oh right I forgot like I said I always forget to do this okay type module oh it's count count Increment, didn't I? Oh, I am here. Increment, not increment. Okay, so right now count is two. Um, but if we were to also import this in, say, file one, we will just do sim something pretty similar. So we are going to import uh, increment here and just increment it twice. And then in index, I might also import, uh, say, import file one. So what this does is it immediately imports uh, the file when we run this code. And it also executes this file. But within this file, we also increment count twice. Um, so now you can see that count is four, because both of them, so we import file one, which also imports the singleton module. Like, we didn't declare an actual singleton here. We just used the module. We exported count. We exported increment and decrement. And you can see that even though we only incremented it twice here, because we import file one, which also increments it twice, count is now four. And this is usually kind of what they mean with side effects as well, because it may not always be obvious that within file one, we are incrementing the count by two. So then you're like logging count, and you're like, what? why is it four? Why is it not two? Like, I only incremented it twice. So this could easily happen with those side effects that you may not always be aware of. So yeah, just make sure that if you ever run into an issue like that, this might be the problem. I've, I've definitely had that before. Yes? Awesome. Ready to move on to proxy? Cool. OK, so I'm just going to scroll up. So normally, when we use objects, I'm just going to make this big. I don't know if it's annoying when I like when this repeatedly goes on. I can just always just pause it <laughs> if this is like overwhelming. But yeah, normally when we use an object or we want to access properties on an object, we can either use dot notation like we did here, like person name returns uh, John Doe. Or when we want to modify it, we can do that instantly as well with dot notation or with bracket notation. Now, with the proxy pattern, we actually use something called a proxy, which is kind of uh, an object that like sits in between that intercepts those requests and also intercepts those responses. So instead of like directly changing uh, the the value in person here, we actually go through that proxy, which invokes the set method on that proxy, and then the proxy forwards that request to the target object. Um, same with get. Now, luckily, in JavaScript, it's pretty easy to use proxies because JavaScript has a built-in proxy object that we can use uh, to use the, the proxy pattern. Now, um, the syntax is kind of like the following. So this is kind of related to like this person here. So if we had a person object, um, the proxy could look something like new proxy, and then the person, which is the target object. So the, the object that it will inter that it'll, yeah, intercept the request to, so like forward the request to, or get the responses from. Uh, and then by default, the proxy object has a lot of built-in methods. Now, two of them are get and set. Those are the only ones that I'll cover right now, but you can just go on MDN and like see all the, all the methods that are available now. Uh, and then again, they, um, they also uh, get pr or, uh, arguments, properties, um, so the first one is, again, target. So that's a target object. And then the property that we want to get, in case we use get, or that we want to set if we are modifying um, a property. 
And also the set has the value, which is like the new value that we're changing that property to. Um, so for example here, if we have this person again, I don't know if I should make this bigger or not. I will do that. Um, so we have a person called John Doe. And then we create a new person proxy, which takes that person object. And whenever we change it, so whenever we want to retrieve a value, maybe we do like person proxy dot name, we get like the value of name is John Doe. Uh, or we want to set um, a property, maybe we want to increment the age. It's like changed age from 42 to uh, 43. So I'll just like, I can show you either in Stackless, I know I also have it here, but I can just show it in the browser. So we can say like person proxy dot name. And then you see that it logs like the value of name is John Doe. So this is super nice because it, like, it ju actually just executed this get method here. But I if we. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, should, yeah, work in console as well. There you go, thank you. Okay. Um, so if we're like changing a value, maybe a person proxy dot age plus equals one is like change age from 42 to 43. So this is super nice. Uh, so we, um, yeah, so here you see that we're using like the target prop, like we're still using like this bracket notation uh, here, but there's actually another. Uh, built in um, method that we can use in JavaScript, namely reflect. Um, and this is so instead of like uh, writing it here, like here, uh, like the target property or target uh, property equals value and then returning true, we can just uh, use the reflect get and reflect set, um, which I find a lot easier to read. Uh, and they do the exact same thing. So with a proxy, it's super easy to add functionality to a certain object. Like maybe every time that we're changing a value, we want to, I don't know, uh, send something to analytics, like, hey, this is now changed. Uh, or the more, I think, useful case of proxy is to add validation. I often use it for validation. Like when I want to make sure that if we're changing a property, it is either always a string if it's a username, uh, or it's always like a number when we're changing the age, or maybe the age shouldn't be like lower than 18, all those things. Uh, it's also super easy to log things like we just saw um, with this one, like we had, like every time we accessed it, we sent a log to the console with the value that we changed. So if you ever need to debug anything, <laughs> like this is definitely a super nice way to do that, to see what are we changing, what is the target object, and what are we changing it to. Um, now, of course, like a big trade-off, or at least something to keep in mind, is that this, those um, methods run every time that we interact with the target object. So if you have a pretty long execution of this thing, like maybe, like I said before, we send it to analytics, and this takes, I don't know, even just like one second to like send there, um, this could definitely lead to performance issues, because we don't want to have to wait every time we interact with, with an object. It has to be instant. Um, but there's some, like, so many things you can do to make sure that it still goes faster, like it's asynchronous, all those things. So that's not too, too big of an issue, but definitely something to keep in mind. So every time when we interact with target object, those methods run. So make sure to keep them small and fast. OK, so to get started, <laughs> OK, this looks a bit scary, but it's not. So to get uh, the exercise with the proxy, what we have here is that we have an object, and we want to add some validation to it. So you can see the validation requirements here. So the username has to be a string that only contains letters. So it cannot be like a string that's like one, two, three, hello, or something. Um, and it needs to be at least three characters long. Um, the email also has to be a valid email address. Now, I've already added some validators to this file, so you don't need to like validate it yourself. Uh, you can just like invoke that is, is valid email function. Uh, also, the is all letters uh, for, the, for the username to make sure that it's, it only contains letters. And for the age, it has to be a number, at least 18. Uh, and to add some logging to it, so not just validation, but also logging, uh, you should change the output to include the date when it was logged, and then the value of that property is this new property. Or uh, it's for get, so the value of this property is this value. Um, I just have like a quick example here. All clear? <laughs> cool. Do you know if map and set data types use proxy under the hood? I'm not entirely sure. Um, I believe I read something about that, but I don't want to say that with absolute certainty. I can't do that. I can look it up, though. <laughs> um, could you restate the best use cases of proxy pattern again? Yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, there are certain. So we have validation, logging, formatting, notifications, and debugging. But for me, um, the most useful one is definitely for validation, like we do in this exercise. You know, if, if the object that we are um, interacting with, if, if we modify it and we have to make sure that it always um, has certain data types, maybe because our, our database expects it, like, so when it needs to be a string, it needs to be a number, uh, we, we want to make sure that we cannot accidentally change it to an invalid type. Um, of course, with TypeScript, that's a bit harder, <laughs> which is great with TypeScript, but this is like a, a much better way to do that at runtime to make sure that, um, yeah, we, we don't change it in, in any unexpected ways. I bet it, yeah, I also like it for just logging. I like I said here, like if you ever need to know like the time at which something was logged, um, you can just add that to, to the uh, get method here, like we did, like a value of prop. Maybe we just, yeah, in this exercise, we're adding a, a new date, so you will, you will see the outcome of that. But yeah, awesome. I like it. It's better to see how things are executed and how long they can take. Awesome. We'll take uh, five minutes then.
All right, ready? I'm just going to copy these requirements real quick. Oh, because I will forget that. Um, let's see. So first, oh, okay, this was pasted without any, okay, it's fine. So first we need to create a new proxy. So I'm just going to create const user proxy equals new proxy, and then the target object is going to be the user. So first we have to get the, or we will just add the get method. So in here, the username, or wait, actually we just have one get. So this is easier to read. When a property is retrieved, so that's when the get method is executed, change the output to new date. And then the value of property is the target. So let's see, console log. And instead of this uh, target property, I'm just going to do reflect dot get uh, target property. I'm just like typing this all out now. I mean, this could have been just like TP, all those things, uh, but just to make it a bit more clear. So target property. So now if we, let's just see if it works. <laughs> so we do user proxy dot dot h node index.js. Yeah, so now we logged it with the timestamp. I know we could have used a different timestamp. This is always really long. Uh, and then the value of h is um, 42. I think I have some, oh, here. So that's all we needed to do to uh, add logging to when a property is retrieved. Now we just need to add the set one. So this one gets the target, the property that we're changing, I cannot type, and the value that we are changing it to. So with these, the requirements were the username property has to be a string that only contains, or only contains letters uh, and has to be at least three characters long. Now, of course, you can like add this validation in, in many different ways, but I'm just going to do, like if property, so the property that we're changing is age, or wait, did I say age? Or username, sorry, is username. If it's not um, is all letters, <laughs> is all letters, oh, all letters, the value that we're changing it to, then throw new error. You can only use uh, letters in your username or something like that. Or if the username is sh uh, shorter than three characters, because we also had that at requirement. So if the value length is shorter than three, throw new error. Please provide a valid username or something like that. So now let's say that we want to add the user proxy. Let's just see if this works. Uh, or otherwise, so if that's not the case, we want to just reflects, return reflects dot set, because we're setting it here. That's, again, the target property value. So then it successfully uh, writes a request to the actual user proxy. So now when we do that username is ha, actually ha. So this shouldn't be um, doable, because we, we're checking that it's at least three characters long. So let's see if this throws an error. Yeah, so please provide a valid username. So right now we didn't. But if we do ha ha. It just works. Actually, I could have just had another log here of the like successfully updated your username or something. Um, and if it's all letters, so now let's change it to aha uh -huh, ten. This should not work. Oh yeah, here you can only use letters in your username. So now we have the first one, which is the username property has to be a string that only contains letters and is at least three characters long. Next one is the email property has to be a valid email address. So in here, if property is email. If it's not, I think, is valid email or something I named it? Yeah. The value that we're passing it, then throw new error. Please provide a valid email. Please. So now if we do like email is john at doe.com, it doesn't, actually, I'll just add like a log here just to say like successfully updated or something. So it successfully updates. But if we do an invalid email, maybe like johndoe.com, which is not an email, it should throw an error. Yeah, please provide a valid email. So that's one validation. Next, the age property has to be a number and has to be at least 18. So if property is age, if uh, type of value is not number, through, and of course, you can add this 
like if, these if statement in better ways. This is just to kind of simply show that this is one possibility. Uh, please provide a valid age or something. And then if value is lower than 18, throw a new error. You, you have to be at least 18 years old. So now when I say, uh, like I have an invalid age, maybe it's somehow a string, which can happen with JavaScript. Uh, we say, like, please provide a valid age. This was not valid. Or if maybe he is too young, he is 17. You have to be at least 18 years old. So yeah, another, again, this is pretty nice to just validate to make sure that the users that we're creating are all the users that we're expecting. Questions? Are higher order functions generally used to implement proxy patterns? Um, they can. I don't know like if that's usually what people do, because now with this new like proxy um, object that's like built in, you don't really have to do that. Um, but it's definitely a user or a useful way to kind of add it as almost like a, a middleware, like a mediator. Like before we add anything, you can use that built-in proxy in whatever way um, to ensure that, yeah, like this, to ensure that the requests that are made to the target object are always what we're expecting. I don't know if there's like a normal way that people usually do it. I haven't seen it. I've only mainly seen it like this. But I'm sure that everyone comes up with their own implementation of it. Could, ins oh, sorry. No worries. Could intercepting request and response objects be a use case? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so th that's essentially like what it's, what it's doing. Like it is intercepting the, or uh, do you mean with like uh, middleware, like express middleware, which is kind of a, a different, I mean, it, it kind of acts as like a, a middleware function, which is another pattern. Um, but it's, yeah, it, it, I, I guess I would, you can compare it definitely to middleware, but it's not, um, a middleware is usually used for like a one single entry point to multiple objects. But with a proxy, it only proxies to one, like it's proxy, object, proxy, object. With a middleware, you have like a middleware, many objects uh, to kind of route them to different ways. So. It is similar if you if you use middleware for just one single um, endpoint, but that's usually not why you would want to use a middleware, uh, anyways. But it's 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 similar. You can use a proxy as middleware, I guess. <laughs> How would you handle arbitrarily nested objects? Um, you can. So I guess what they mean is like if or if you don't know how they're nested, or if maybe we have like address and then like street. Uh, main street. Of course, this is still the same as get. So if you are getting, like, say, dot street dot name is ha. Huh. Or actually, let's just get it first. Oh, did I not? Oh, address dot street. Address dot street. I've actually like not done that before with a proxy. So oh here, the value of address is object object. So yeah, so then you have to add like this is a very simple, simple way of like logging things. So if you know that your object is going to be nested, just make sure that it has some like recursion. So if it contains like multiple steps, if we have like address dot street, make sure that you are not just logging like the value of property. Like in, in this case, it is trying to stringify an object. So you get like this object object. So here maybe you can say like if type of um, property equals like, I don't know, uh, I guess object is one, then like log it in, in, in a different way. But this was just kind of a simple example like, hey, this is how you could do it if you know that your object is only going to be this one flat, um, like not deep object. I don't know if there's a better name for objects that aren't deep. <laughs> I forgot the name, but yeah. It's, it's all like, you can definitely use it. And you can also, I think, actually, let's see if we can add just a proxy. I haven't done this before. Actually, just do address. I guess we can do this. Uh, street, main street. I just want to create a proxy for just the address. Const address proxy is new proxy user dot address. Not sad. Get uh, target property. I'm just going to log this the same way. Uh, let's see. So now if we do address proxy dot street equals, uh, I, no, we're just getting it, sorry. So let's see what this is. 
I'm just going to comment this out real quick. Maybe it'll throw an error like, memory is not defined. Yeah, property is not defined. Oh, because it's property. Oh yeah, so you can also just create proxy, obviously. So yeah, I guess you can just create it on, on any object. So if you only care about the deeply nested objects, you can just add that proxy to, to just that thing. And I think you could probably also maybe add it directly. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. Although yeah, I guess you can. Like, You can get but yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm just kind of playing around here now. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean you can use proxies, I guess, on on any object. And if you know if you know the structure of the object that you're using, just make sure that if you're formatting or validating anything, that you account for all these possibilities. Uh, which in this case, I did not, because I just knew that it only consists or it had first name, last name, all those things. Yeah. Why not? Um, a proxy, so if, if you add this to the user object and it would like allocate memory for those functions like whenever you create that user. Um, whereas with a proxy we can like keep it on just that proxy if that makes sense. So if we added this directly like say here, um, maybe instead of directly modifying, and I guess another one which is maybe like we can just set first name which we would just always be using, uh, sorry, to set the first name, which is maybe like a value. And maybe we can like update the first name that way. Um, but there's still the possibility in that case that we can just directly modify like user.firstName. Or maybe we don't have first name, we just like, a first name is always like a, a function or something. That, that wouldn't really be memory efficient because functions are like other objects under the hood. So every time we create an object, we're essentially creating a new object for all of these types. So using that validation directly on the object doesn't, A, doesn't stop people from uh, modifying the properties because we could still just do that. If we know the name of the property, we could still use like dot notation, bracket notation to update them. Um, and secondly, it's like definitely more difficult to implement that on a direct object. Like maybe in the class, you can easily update with like this dot blah, blah, blah equals um, the new value. Um, but with a regular object, that gets a bit more tricky. If that if that explains the question. Like, I guess the more you use proxies, the more you will see their value. Because at least that's what worked, or kind of what happened to me. First, I was like, why would you really need a proxy for all these things? Um, but when you really start using it in actual applications, you're like, ah, this, like, now this is the perfect use case for a proxy. And then you'll see, like, it, it, it just kind of clicks. Um, but it definitely takes some implementation in, like, different settings to see the, the value of proxies for sure. It reminds me of like almost an interface. Yeah, okay. exactly. Definitely is. You could hand this out to like an export and, mm -hmm. um, and not have to expose the object directly. <coughs> All right, ready to move on to the observer pattern? As, sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, the person said I could see value in displaying dates in different formats um, as a useful oh. use case. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, honestly so many use cases to proxies, and I think they it, it applies to so many different applications. Um, yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty powerful. <laughs> Why use the reflect object instead of directly accessing the properties? Honestly, it's just like easier to type, it's more readable. Um, so like you don't really have to worry about the names that you gave to like the object and the property here. Um, like you saw before, I had like the type of like property not defined because I usually call it prop and all those things. Um, personally, I just I prefer using reflect just for readability. Uh, people know what's like going on. And also with the set, you usually have to return a truthy value. Only if it returns a truthy value will it actually forward that um, like set command, the modification command, to the target object. Um, 
But this is pretty easy to forget because like, if we didn't return anything here, it would return undefined, which is falsy. So it would never actually forward that request to the target object. But reflect.set automatically returns a truthy value, meaning that it will forward that request. So otherwise, you could have maybe done like, um, well, first, of course, we had to like change it in that case. So object.prop equals value, and then maybe like return true or something which to me isn't always very intuitive. I forget to do that, and then you don't see the update. So personally, I, I prefer to use reflect set. Maybe it also has some built-in benefits that I'm not aware of. Um, but to me, I just like it for readability. And yeah, like it's, it's easy to use. What should you do to set with the proxy to a falsy value? To, sorry? What should you do to set with a proxy to a falsy value? To a falsy value? So do, do you mean like if you want to set something else to false, like maybe like is human? Or is that not? So I think you were saying that it's, if it's a falsy value with a reflect, it doesn't get set. No, so if, if that uh, sets method, in this case, returns uh, not a truthy value, for example, here, like because we um, uh, actually, let me find that. Like we throw an error here, which of course is a falsy value. Like it stops the execution there, um, so it will not forward the command to the actual target object. Um, but we can like the value itself can be false, but we cannot return a falsy value from this method. So if I do return like false here, I mean after like everything, e even maybe after here or anything false. Like maybe th th it doesn't have to be explicitly false. It can just be undefined. The, um, the request will not get a pass to the target object. But of course, the value itself can be false, as long as we don't return a false value from this specific um, method. Because we're, like, this, it's not that the returned value of the set method is what gets passed to the target object. That's not the case. Like that would happen maybe with middleware. Like the return value from middleware gets passed to the endpoint. But with a proxy, that's not the case. Like the only thing that a proxy does is like within this um, uh, method, we can we can change the the property. So we cannot just say like, okay, the set method is now returned a value to the target object. No, like that that's not what a proxy does. We have to explicitly like update the target object with that value if that makes more sense. Because I think that's maybe the confusion where like with middleware, that's, that's what happens. Um, but that, that's not the case with the proxy. So like if it's false, maybe it's some like target dot uh, is human is false. Or like is the value in that case is false. That's totally possible. That's no problem at all. As long as then it returns true. <laughs> yep, they said that clears things up, so thanks. OK, cool. Exactly, yeah, reflect set returns a truthy value, so you don't have to worry about that. <coughs> All right, let's move on to the observer pattern. It somehow always scro scrolls down to my stack list whenever I open it. So with the observer pattern, if you've used React or just JavaScript in general, you may be familiar with something called observables. Um, with the observer pattern, we have well, there are multiple parts at play here. So we have the observable object, which can be observed by subscribers. And an observable object can, in turn, notify all those subscribers um, when an event occurs. So for example, in, or in this example, we have an observable there. It has a notify method, a subscribe method, and an unsubscribe method, just like visualized, not in, in the code there. Um, so what we can do is we can subscribe certain functions or any logic really to that observable. And then when the notify method is invoked on this observable, all the subscribers that are currently subscribed to that observable get notified with that data. So for example, if we then notify, like notify subscribers on that observable, and we have four functions here that are all subscribers to this observable. I'm just going to make this uh, big real quick. Um, Whenever we notify it with certain data, so here the data is a string notify subscribers, all of these subscribers will get notified with that string notify subscribers. And what they do with it, that's up to them. The observable doesn't care. Um, but they, they get past that as their argument as data. So maybe we want to um, 
uh, add some like analytics here. Maybe we want to notify uh, an observable whenever a user clicked on something. This is something, or this we'll actually do this in the, in the challenge later on. Um, but it's it's a very useful way to um, notify a lot of different parts of your application without having to repeat that code throughout the application. It's not like oh we have to send the request in like within every function. We can just all manage that within one observable, and they can then notify all the subscribers. Um, it probably gets more clear in the uh, challenge that we have later on. But yeah, so a, an observer object, it's kind of, uh, we can just have a singleton like we had before. And the very, or the easiest implementation is to have a notify method like we saw before, which or gets some data. This data can just come from like throughout the application. And then ev all the observers that are currently subscribed to this um, observable, we uh, invoke that observer with the data. We don't know what these observers are. We don't know what they do. The observable doesn't care. We just care about passing the data to all the observers that are currently subscribed. Then, of course, we have the subscribe method, which is just pushing that function to the observers array. So all the observers that care about this observable. I know I use these func or methods like observer, observable. Um, and then also we have unsubscribe to like remove that function, again, from the observers list. Um, so the easiest way is, or a very simple um, example here, I guess, is say we have an observable and we have a button, so like an admin by ID button, uh, and we just want to click it, we can just notify the observable with like clicked. And say that we have a lot of subscribers, maybe like analytics subscribers, Google analytics subscribers, email subscribers, I don't know what all these functions do. They can be like declared elsewhere in our code. They would all get notified with this string, and maybe they can also like, send events like asynchronously. Um, based on that user event. So that's something that an observable can do. Um, for example, here, let me see if I can split the screen here. We have this observer, which is the exact same implementation that we had before. So we have notify, subscribe, and unsubscribe. Then we also just have like a fake like, analytics page. So we have like sent to Google Analytics, sent to custom analytics, and then sent to email. Uh, and then here, I'm subscribing them. So now, whenever I invoke that subscribe method, these functions gets, uh, get pushed to the observer array. Wait, I thought this was the observer, to this observer's array. So then when you see when we notify, I think it might fork it, um, this invokes that method. So it would, in turn, <laughs> I see like all this method. It would then pass this data like here, uh, as like this data. So now we see if we run, or so in index.js, I just have this simple notify function, and then I also have a notify just after a second, just to kind of simulate maybe user events, I don't know. So when we run this, you can see that it automatically notified all the subscribers, because we, uh, we imported the analytics here. So it ran this file, it executed um, all these contents. So it created the functions, and then also subscribed it to the observer. We then notified it here back in index.js with this string. Um, which then sent the string from the observer to, or from the observable, sorry, to all the observers. So it invokes these functions with this data. Yeah, so just look at the trade offs for the observer. Um, yeah, so the observer objects, like I said before, like the function in this case, are not tightly coupled to the observable objects. So the observable doesn't care about what the observers do. All it cares about is, OK, I'm going to pass this data to them. I don't care what they do with it. Here's your data. Um, so it can just be decoupled at any time. So maybe our application grows, or it, it changes its need. Maybe we don't want to have analytics anymore. We just easily unsubscribe. Um, yeah, so here, an example, like the observable object is responsible for like monitoring the events, and the uh, sub or observers simply handle the received data in whatever way possible. Now, of course, make sure that. If you're notifying all the subscribers, for example, and I know this is like a micro optimization, but with like this for each method, if you have millions of observers, this might take a while. Um, so just make sure that you're doing that in a performant way. Maybe if it's asynchronous with like uh, promise to all or something that they can run in parallel, because in most cases the observers are not they don't rely on each other. Like they don't necessarily have to run sequentially. They're all just kind of standalone on their own. Um, okay. So I have this simple exercise here with the observer pattern. So we have two buttons. So I have, I'm a pink button and I'm a blue button. Now you can see that I've added an event listener here with a click. 
and it has some data, and it sends all these data to like the Google Analytics, Custom Analytics, and sends an email. Same with the blue button, but the, of course the blue button sends different data. Now your exercise here is to change this so we aren't like repeating ourselves. We are not like explicitly invoking this function with the data. Instead, we will notify an observer that this click happened, and this observer will then notify the send to Google Analytics, send to custom analytics, and send to email um, to achieve like a similar uh, uh, result. Like we still want to log this data, or we still want to send it to Google Analytics, custom analytics, whenever the user clicks. Just not in this way, because this is, you know, we're repeating ourselves here. It's not very scalable, so we want to use an observer instead. Is that a good exercise? Is it clear? <laughs> Anything? Cool. All right. So instead of repeating the functions, we notify the observer, and observer will take care of exactly all those, uh, broadcasting. Yes. So it's uh, it's if you just need a sneak peek, it's pretty similar to what we did, uh, or maybe not. Oh yeah, I guess it's pretty similar to what we did here, with the analytics and then subscribing them. Kind of reminds me of events. Yeah. Because like, it if is. you click a button, anything that's subscribed to the click listener, mm -hmm. that's run. using the observer pattern as well. Like, it is really just a pattern. You know, it's more like a way that you think about architecting your code, about how your, how the data is passed to certain parts of your code. So I would say that yeah, the event is also using that observer pattern. Maybe not like one on one, and it doesn't have to be. Um, but yeah, like it's very similar. Five minutes or so? Maybe a little longer, but okay, done. sure. <laughs> Uh, I believe so. I haven't used a pub sub pattern in ages, um, so I don't know if it has like other Im or other functionality that maybe makes it easier. Because like the observer pattern is of course like a very like low level. This is just a way to think about things. Um, but I would say they're the same for what I know. Um, yeah, because it's like publish, subscribe. Yeah.
All right, let's look at the solution for the observer pattern. So the very first thing I'm going to do is to create this observer. Actually, I'm going to fork it. That's what I'm going to do first. Um, create this observer file, observer.js. Um, and then I'm going to just say uh, export default object freeze. Now the first thing we're going to do is I want to actually create an array that is the subscribers or um, observers, which is an empty array at first. So when I add a subscribe method that can that takes a function because we're we can subscribe functions and all it's going to do is like have observers dot push func. There are different ways to add stuff to an array. This is just what I'm using now for uh, simplicity. And then I also want to have a notify function. And this takes some data. And this maps over all the observers, dot for each observer, and it invokes the observer with this data. Um, this should actually be observable. I always observable. Observable. Yeah, I spelled it correctly. All right, cool. So now we have this observable. Now I'm going to import the observable here import observable. I always like to just capitalize it, but you don't have to, from observable.js. And in here, I'm going to subscribe them. Dot subscribe, send to Google Analytics. Oh, observable dot subscribe. Uh, this was, sorry for the live update. That's uh, always a bit annoying to see, but observable dot Observe, I'm so bad at typing this word. Observable.subscribe, send to email. All right, so now that we've had we have that, I want to go into index.js. So instead of importing all these functions now, I just want to import this observable. Uh, observable from observable.js. Um, and in here, what I'm going to do is observable.notify data. So I can remove all of this because we already subscribed that right here. Um, so whenever we notify it, it automatically invokes all these functions in this in the observable. Um, same goes for this pink button. All right, let's see. Moment of truth. Let's see if it worked. Observer is not a function. Okay, wait. Where did I do that? Server. Uh, observer. Observer data. Did it do something? Oh, here, observer, observable. I see. Can't see yours now. Always a fun thing of live coding. Uh, let's see. So we have the observers of push func subscribe. We're subscribing a function. This should be function, right? Yeah, function data observers of reads observe uh, observer observer data. All right, this should work. Uh, let's see if we can refresh. Ooh, am I logging? Sorry about this. Let's see. We have observable. OK, I'm just going to log this real quick. So whenever we notify, let's see if we're actually notifying. It's probably a very obvious thing that I'm not seeing here. So if you see it, let me know. Observe. That observer function on line 7. It's it's not oh because I'm not okay so I'm not importing um, the analytics here and this is where I'm subscribing it that's it so right now there are no subscribers you to notify just have one window, like, yeah sorry sorry like is, like, okay so the view is kind of confusing. I can imagine okay so right. this was my bad um, I'm just going to remove this console log so the mistake I made here is that here in index I could we, could we start oh yeah of course. Wait, what? Do you want me to start all over? I can do that. That's yeah, I think so. Just with the multiple windows, I think with bouncing around those a little. I, yeah, OK, OK. Um, I can just like re-implement it now that I know what I did. <laughs> I just forgot to import the thing. But do you want me to just redo it yeah, entirely? Yeah, I think so, because it okay. only took you a minute, so. OK, sure. I, I um, I'm just going to reopen it and then like fork it again. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is create this observable file. And then we're going to create this um, empty array that has the observers, which you know initially doesn't have any observers yet. And then we're going to export this observable, which I'm just going to freeze. You don't have to do that, but I like to do that. Uh, and then the first thing I'm going to do is add this notify function. 
So this gets some data, and it will map over these um, the observers that we will later subscribe. It um, gets this observer and invokes them with the data. Then we also have the subscribe. Subscribe, I'll just type a bit slower, which takes a function. And this uh, pushes it to this observer's array. Now, of course, you can like push this to that array in, in different ways. Um, I'm just using function for now. And maybe also to add some validation, you want to make sure that what you're pushing is actually a function so that you don't run into that error with like, observer is not a function. You're trying to invoke a string. That's not possible. But just for simplicity here, we just assume that we will always pass a function. Um, and then here in analytics, I want to import this observable, import observable from observable.js. And then I'm going to subscribe them. So they will get pushed to this uh, observers array. Dot subscribe, uh, send to custom analytics, observable, subscribe, send to Google Analytics, and then observable, subscribe, <laughs> send to email. Then when we go back into index, I do want to import this file just to make sure that we are like subscribing them here. So this is another side effect. So you know when we're importing a file, this gets executed. Um, of course, we could have also kept like these and maybe used, moved this over to here, whatever, whatever you want. Yeah, right now I haven't imported the observable yet. So ob observable from observable observable.js. Um, but right now, I'm just, actually, let's keep it that way. So I'm not subscribing them here. I'm just subscribing them here. So um, we can now remove all of these. We just have to say observable.notify data, and then observable.notify data. So let's see if that worked. Again, observer is not a function. Wait. I feel like I'm not. OK, I'm just going to see what I'm subscribing here. So you're calling observer data and the for each. But that is fine, because the observer is a function, or like it should be a function. Let's, let's see. Um, func. It is a function, so that's what we're pushing. Let's see what is, uh, let's see, observers. These are all functions. Uh, yeah, but like we're mapping over it. So this observer, that that is oh, the yeah, function. Yeah, yeah, so um, my, my like we're, we're invoking that with a function. But luckily, of course, I just have the solution right here. So I, I probably just made like a typo somewhere. Um, we'll just look at the solution instead. This is why live coding is always so fun. No, I mean, mm -hmm. I think, no, 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 I, I think oh. we could solve it. No, 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 but this is fine, because like okay, this is okay. doing the exact same thing. Yeah. I'm using the exact same code. Um, so yeah, and here we, again, like created the uh, observer or like observable with the notify function that we had before. So we, uh, you know, for each over the observers, we subscribe. Uh, and then um, we, we also have the unsubscribe function. So here in analytics, I'm subscribing all the uh, functions here. And then back in index, I just have to um, notify this observer with this data. So let's see if this, it's like this worked yesterday. Maybe it's some like stack blitz thing though. I think you have to import the function. Yeah. Well, let me see. See, that's so weird. I was having the same problem earlier. Like it was working for me fine, and then I had like messed with something and it stopped working. Yeah, I, I think. I thought I changed it back and I can't. Get no, it. this is. So is this now a stack blitz issue? <coughs> yeah, I'm just I'm confused. I was getting the same error, but within some refresh, mine everything was. Clear. Yeah, maybe I just yeah, have to so refresh it. The code both the same, so. Oh, like, look, yeah, I refreshed it and then it started working. OK. Yeah. I was like, am I going? OK. Yeah, it looked like this the code was working. I know. Right. 
Okay, well, sorry about that. Observers are not that annoying to work with <laughs> normally, I promise, I promise. But yeah, so just to recap, so what we're doing here is we're subscribing it. This subscribe method is pushing it to an array, all the observers, so whenever we notify it, we invoke the observers uh, in this array with that data. So this is just a much nicer way to like, throughout the application, we can just notify this observer anywhere, and it's a singleton. So we can, um, if we have different files, or usually in larger applications, um, we can just import this observer, and we don't have to care about like repeating all those analytic method methods every time. Maybe if we like rename one of those functions, uh, we'd have to update like most of our code base, or maybe like type typos and stuff like that. So observers make it so much easier to um, to work with data that has to get passed to to many um, observers or observables. So I confuse that word every time. Observables make it so much easier to work with many observers. Actually, two like it doesn't warrant an observer, but like five, yeah, like for sure. I mean, yeah. In this example, there is no reason to use an observer. I think it's totally fine to just use those methods. But normally, especially with maybe like user tracking, like user analytics, uh, or if there's ever an error and you just want to send it to like an external service, like a logging service, um, I don't know any any anal analytic service. Um, which is a very common to do that, like throughout the application, like especially when you're working with with React or anything else, you have so many different components that you know don't all, um, are they're, they're not always structured in a very performant way where you can just like import all these uh, analytics functions every time. So yeah, I mean, it, of course you can use it like at any scale. You can still use it also for just these two functions, but obviously it's, uh, it's way more, uh, you get more benefits out of it when it's actually like a larger application. Um, yeah, so you don't have to worry about could you quickly touch upon the real uh, use case for uh, unsubscribe? For unsubscribe? Um, there are many use cases. I mean, maybe you just want to use it um, like one time. Like if something happens or if it doesn't happen, then you want to make sure that this subscriber doesn't get invoked more often, maybe based on like external events or if a certain time has passed, like there's a certain timeout, um, or if an error occurred, you want to make sure to unsubscribe it. So like while the program is running, it will never try to call that uh, observer again. Um, honestly, yeah, I feel like there are many, there, there's not really a specific like use case I can think of now because there are like so many different types of use cases. Normally I do it, like I said, based on like uh, an error handling. Like if an error gets thrown somewhere else and I, I, that is somehow connected to that observer, I want to make sure to unsubscribe it so I'm not calling it more often. Um, this error can maybe come from like an external API, like if I've already re uh, reached my request limit or like API request limit, just to make sure that I'm not getting like a huge bill at the end of the month because I kept on like sub or, uh, invoking that subscriber. Um, yeah, they're just, it, it's a better, it, it's nice that once, you know, an observer is subscribed that you can also unsubscribe it if, if need be. Um, yeah, there, there are many, many use cases. Mm -hmm. So maybe we don't care if it fails. Mm -hmm. but I'm imagining a situation where I, I go overboard with observables. I think they're really cool, and now I've got my my observers <laughs> crashing, creating problems. Yeah, like, yeah. Or I want one to happen, and then but I but if that one happens, I want the second one to happen for, for sure. Mm -hmm. Is there like a juggling problem you can encounter with observables where it's maybe not a good case to use observables? Yeah, I mean, and this is kind of this almost goes back to like the decreased performance here. It is good for um, like if you have many functions that you want to invoke, but then there's yeah a certain threshold. Like if it's too many, or if there are two, um, like if they relate to each other. Like if one has to go first, then definitely do not use an observable. Do not subscribe them to the same observable because the observer doesn't care about how it's run. All it cares about is notifying that function. Doesn't care how it's done uh, and in what order. Um, and of course, yeah, if you have like said before, like millions of subscribers, it could take a long time to notify all of them. Um, maybe even like results in a server timeout. So you want to ensure that the observers themselves are not um, like related to each other. Like the result of one should not, or not dependent on each other, I should say. Like the result of one should not affect the other one. Um, maybe you can list like multiple observables for that, but you can definitely go overboard with like having observables everywhere 
and then ending up in this like weird problem like wait where does certain data come from where why does it get invoked all that stuff um, it can definitely be pretty tricky to understand where stuff happens with observables I find um, I think that's why RxJS has lots and lots of operators yeah exactly yeah if you use RxJS you yeah exactly they, they're trying to solve that problem um, personally I don't use Rx or I haven't used RxJS in like react applications but when you go to their um, I'll just, I don't know if I, oh, RxJS, um, just to show you real quick. So they have like an overview. So they're all using like observables as well. So you have like observers, um, and in here you can actually see they give you a lot more to work with. Like you can invoke like the next function, kind of like middleware. Um, yeah, so like what, I'm, what I showed before, it's kind of more like the, the, the pattern behind observables, like this is what you can do. And then luckily there are many developers that take that pattern and simplify it for those exact reasons that you said, like, okay, this is perfect, but there are so many um, things that might go wrong. Um, so yeah, if you want to use observables, I would definitely, you know, like check out RxJS or any similar uh, library that may we help you. We do have multiple courses on RxJS. Yeah, oh yeah, perfect. Check out their courses on <laughs> RxJS in that case. So are the subscribers notified in random order or according to like all uh, unsubscribed first? No, that so that just depends on how you implement the um, the notify. So in here I do the for each, so that does it sequentially. Maybe if I knew that they were um, promises, I could do like promise.all or something, which returns a promise and then uh, runs all those uh, functions like in parallel. Um, so that all depends on your own implementation. It depends on the data you expect. Um, but yeah, it, it's, that doesn't really, yeah, like I said, it just depends on your own implementation. In this case, it's all in sequence. <laughs> for, this, oh, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry, for this example, so like we could have created a wrapper function that called all those functions, um, like the three, the, what is it, the Google and the custom. Yeah. Um, what, like, why would you, you know, reach for like a wrapper function versus an observable? I feel like they have different use cases. Um, with an observable, you can handle um, like a lot of different subscribers. Like maybe a wrapper function in this case could have looked something like function. I don't know if this is kind of what you were thinking of, um, which in turn. Well, actually, no. I, I will not live code this because that would just go wrong. Anyways, um, yeah, like, like call all three of those functions. Yeah, exactly. One function and in, in just one call that function. Exactly. Instead of the observ observer. Don't yeah. Die. Yeah. No. Of course. Um, like in this case, that's totally an option. I feel like so observers in general, it, it makes it so much easier. Like in this case, I could just uh, import the observer here and just notify it and. This name isn't super uh, descriptive. Like maybe I could say like analytics observer or something. Observable, I should say. Observable. Notify. Um, like if we had to import that wrapper function, maybe if we need to have way more functions uh, in that wrapper function, we'd like have to update that every time. Whereas here, we can easily change it. Like we can unsubscribe subscribers. We can subscribe subscribers at runtime. We cannot easily like update a wrapper function at runtime. So even so, that's what I mean. Like they have different use cases. If you know that a couple of functions will always run the same ones, a wrapper function might be might be better. An observable is more for like, okay, we don't know what's who's going to subscribe to it. We don't know if they might unsubscribe. Um, we don't. The observable doesn't care. It's just a, a nice way to like pass data to potential subscribers if they are uh, subscribed. If that clears things up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Um, I'm curious in apps, and it might be hard to speak to this, but would it be common to have a number of different observables, and how would mm -hmm. those, how might you delineate between observables? Would it, I guess, depend on which subscribers you wanted yeah. to be attached? Yeah, exactly. So, of course, like, um, kind of like I, I did here, maybe this is like our analytics observable. Um, so we know that all the functions that are subscribed here are all dedicated to sending analytics. So maybe even in like the, the notify or in the um, subscribe, maybe I, we want to do some extra validation. Like, OK, is this the function that we expect? Is it the type we expect? In the notify, we might also, I don't know, add different, add any different logic, I don't know. 
Um, and then normally, if we maybe want to have another observable, like a click observable or something, like we want to track a user click events, that would be another observable, just to make sure that we don't have like one giant observable that sends events to all the, like if we had a click observable, we don't want them to send events to analytics, or like if that's not what we expect. Um, although I guess click is the wrong thing here, because I'm literally using click. So I guess maybe a, a scrolling observable. Um, yeah, so it's just having multiple observables in that case, if you need to use observables for, for that specific use case, uh, is definitely the better way to go, just to make sure that you don't unnecessarily invoke your observers, send analytics, all that stuff. Cool. A place I use it is if I have like a model, and like any time that that model updates, it'll just trigger an event, and then yeah. anything in my code can li listen and subscribe in many different places. Mm -hmm. And then that seems to work really well. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very powerful pattern. Like, it's very nice. Very nice to use. And then just a tech issue. So, like JavaScript modules are um, held in cache. So I think it was just loading the old code from cache. So I don't oh, know if Stack okay. Blitz has a way to like hard Clear. refresh. Yeah, I mean instead in of when you hit refresh, like maybe I can just disable cache in here, but I'm not sure because I think they use web. Like, it's something that we might need to sort out because. Exercises that we work on, or yeah, um, but that's clearly what's happening because if you just use native JavaScript modules, yeah, stuck mm -hmm. in cache, right? Uh, so okay, just, I will keep like, that in mind. Stack blitz, like maybe you just have to hit refresh a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. Okay, like we did, and then that'll clear the cache. Like that's that seemed to be how we fixed it, right? We just hit refresh. A bunch exactly. Of times. Yeah. So we might make a note. Yeah. We'll, we'll just have to sort it out. Yeah, for sure. I think I can also ask Stack Blitz if maybe they can fix it internally, but I like don't think add, it's on them. Like add like a hard refresh or button or something. Yeah. In their UI. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, let's move on. This would be a good place to we need our tech break now. Okay. Um, just like five minutes. There's no exercise on the factory pattern, so I don't really know how to end it if we are going to have a break in between factory and prototype. Like, I, I will go to prototype pattern, but then I guess we have a break in between. Um, we so there isn't. Go yes, to it's edited later. So we could just okay. go to the, I mean, if you wanted to, we could just go to the exercise for prototype and then do lunch. OK, I can, OK, yeah, sure. The factory is like so small, so. Oh, wait, is there? No. Oh, I guess maybe I do have one. Never mind, I do have an exercise. Sorry okay. about that, guys. <laughs> cool, perfect. All right, so the next one is the factory pattern. I'm just going to close this real quick. So the factory pattern um, is a pattern that uses like a special function, and this function is called the factory function. Uh, and we can use this function, which in JavaScript is pretty easy. It's just like an arrow function to create many of the same objects. Like we know all the um, properties that it's going to have, and then based on what we pass to it, maybe we add some more properties, maybe we change them a little bit, and so on. So like here we're creating two users, like John and Sarah. Now we only pass the first name and last name, but the object that we create also contains the ID, created at, and the full name based on the properties that we passed. Um, yeah, like I said, it's pretty simple in JavaScript to create a factory function. This pattern is really more for languages that don't really have built-in objects. So it's like more difficult to create many objects of the same type. But luckily, in JavaScript, we can just use an arrow function or a regular function that returns an object. Um, no, OK, so the trade-offs for the factory pattern is that you know we don't have to recreate the same object or type the same object out every time. Uh, we will also see this in the exercise later on. So we can just easily create many of the same objects with just like a one-liner. We just have to say create user, create user, create user instead of like having that user object every time. But yeah, like I said, in JavaScript, it's not really a pattern. Oh, I see there's like an overflow here. Um, 
Now, we will go into the prototype pattern a bit later, which actually shows that this pattern is not very memory efficient. Um, maybe you should try to avoid it if you're actually creating a really large amount of objects. Um, but we will cover that in the prototype pattern. So yeah, just to recap, all it does is we just have a function that returns an object. That's the vectory, vectory pattern, and that function is called a factory function. So when we look at the exercise here, you see that we have many books. Like we have Harry Potter, uh, Great Gatsby, and all this stuff. Um, and in index, I guess, yeah, we're logging all of those books. But in this case, so we um, created, like explicitly created all of these objects. So the exercise here is to create a factory function instead that returns book, instead of having to write those books like this. Cool.
All right, so let's look at the solution for this one. I'm just going to go to the books.js one. And in here, I'm just going to create the um, factory function. Again, the sign in. So export, well, we can just keep it in here. So const create book. I'm just going to say this is going to take a title, an author, and the ISBN number. And this returns the title, author, and ISBN. I'm not going to add any other properties, although I could have. In this case, I won't. So in this case, book one, we can actually just say create book. Harry Potter, JK Rowling, and AB123. I'm not going to type this out for all of them. Let's see, we've got other Harry Potters here. Book four. Uh, we're just going to create that one. So this is the Great Gatsby, the Great Gatsby. Okay, I'm not. I cannot type out that name. I'm lazy. And then CD, CD, four, five, six. Okay. Well, this is enough books for me. I'm not going to <laughs> change all of these. It takes a bit too long. So right now, we've just created those books with the create book function. So instead of having to create that object every time. Um, we know that all these books now always have the same stru structure. They always have the title, the author, and ISBN. So when we go back into index now, you can see that we again uh, import books. And we have the exact same objects as we had before. But this time, at least we know the exactly the object that will get returned. Uh, we don't have to, or we don't risk like accidentally creating typos. Like if we had a book five that's like title or something, which totally could have happened. Um, so yeah, it adds a lot of like type safety. Um, and yeah, so if we wanted to add any other properties based on the pr uh, arguments that we pass, it's super easy to do that with the factory function. But luckily, it's very easy in, in JavaScript to, uh, to create that. Any questions? Awesome. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> to implement this instead of a function, mm -hmm. would this still be considered the factory pattern? Um, so that would more be the prototype pattern, which is what I'll be covering after this. Um, so yeah, using a class in this case, and then, well, so we could have used a constructor here. So we could have said like class book is constructor, title, author, ISBN. And this again uh, creates um, the exact same thing. I'm, I won't like type this out now because I know I will have typos again. Um, yeah, you. We can also, of course, create new instances of a book. Well, actually, I will just finish it. So this a title is title, and this the author is author uh, author. This dot ISBN is ISBN, and instead of like saying create book here, we could have said like export cons book five is new book. So we create a new instance of this book, um, which is uh, I don't know. I'm just gonna do Harry Potter. Um, so you could have totally done this. Uh, personally, I prefer just having the more like concise syntax when, whenever possible. However, using classes does have some uh, benefits, which we'll talk about later uh, when it comes to like memory. Um, but yeah, that's part of like the prototype pattern. But if you if you prefer this syntax over the regular object, that's completely fine. They both pretty much result in, um, or the, yeah, they both pretty much have the same results. It's just that this is now an, actually an instance of book. So when we run this, uh, let's see. You can see that this is actually like a book instead of just an, a random object. It's an instance. But yeah, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> cool. No more questions? Would you consider the old school way of creating a class in JS as a factory pattern? Um, like we're doing here, I, I guess it could be considered a factory pattern. Um, but a factory is more like we have a function. We, like, we have a factory function that returns an object. And just returning a class here, it's, it's not a function. Like we're just creating instances. Now, maybe if we had like a function that says like create book that which returns a class, then I would consider it a factory pattern. Um, but we, with a normal class and like creating instances, it's not necessarily like a factory pattern. Um, but again, like these patterns language. come from different languages usually, like uh, languages that where it's not easy to create many objects. So yeah, in JavaScript, especially nowadays, the factory pattern is still usable. Like 
is obviously usable. It's something that you might just implement not knowing that it's called the factory pattern. Um, but yeah, it's it's the like official implementation. It's not like the, the benefits um, are not the same as for like other languages like Java or like C++, all that stuff. So it's a bit different. we were talking about before we had the class keyword we used to do like new function. New function. Capital book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like that. Yeah, that, that would definitely be considered a factory function in that case, instead of like creating um, new instances. At least if I'm thinking of the right thing, because I think, I mean, I won't type that out now. But yeah, you could like create a function that then returned an object, like um, either explicitly or implicitly, which would be considered a factory function, yeah. Cool. Well. Oh, uh, we just did the exercise. No, I mean, I, I'm talking about. Oh, the prototype. prototype um, I think this one would, might take a bit longer because there's well, more. To not getting through the exercise, but just getting to. Oh, like, to the exercise. Okay, yeah, I guess we could do that. Yes. That generally only takes like five or ten. Okay. Okay, so then next is the. Get one tech check thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like being on CNN or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next is the prototype pattern, and this may be a or this is probably a pattern that you have used many times when working with JavaScript, but you may not have known it. Um, so what we saw with the factory pattern is that it's pretty easy to have an object um, that, or to have many of the same objects. For example, in this example, we have um, a factory function like create dog. <laughs> so we want to create many dogs. Maybe we have a name and an age. And also, all dogs can bark when we console uh, the name is barking, and we have like wagtail. Now, this is totally doable. It's fine. Like this works. However, what's happening here is that whenever we are creating those new objects, for every object, we're also allocating memory for all the functions here. So even though the wagtail and bark functions are identical for all the objects, we're still allocating new memory for each and every one of them. So this is not very memory efficient. Now, instead, what we can do in JavaScript is to use something called the prototype pattern. Uh, and this is where the classes come in, because everything on a class that's like defined directly on the body is considered to be a part of the prototype. And the constructor is like the individual or like the um, unique object that gets returned. So any functionality that is shared between those many objects can be defined on the class body. Um, so what we see here is that we've now moved the bark and the wagtail methods from like in, instead of having them directly on these objects that we created, we now um, go like up the prototype chain, as they say, or go down the prototype chain. People use it kind of synonymously. Um, and instead, it's now on like that dog prototype. So whenever we invoke um, a function here, I think this is just an example. So we can just say like a dog one or two and then bark oh, index.js. So you can see here that we've created many new dog instances that just say like name, age. Actually, I will show this in um, a browser console because they're just a bit better at showing the, the prototype. So you can kind of see what's going on here. Um, I'll just open it in here if that's all right. I'm just going to do. Okay, so we've just created many new dogs again, dog one, dog two. So when we just log dog one, you can only, or you can see that there's only name and age. Now you might be thinking like, okay, but where's like bark and wagtail? Because we can still use that. Now, whenever we log this dog again, I'm just going to clear this just to make it cleared up. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. You can see that there is a prototype object. Yeah, like these logs. Um, and this prototype object is essentially, like you can see here, this maybe sounds or looks very familiar to the dog we just created because we had a constructor. And then we also added the bark and wagtail methods to this class object. 
So here we can see that Bark and Wagtail, those methods, are available on the prototype. And this prototype is shared among all the objects that we just created. So uh, any dog instance or any instance from the class automatically also has access to those methods. And we don't have to worry about allocating like, a space in memory for those methods because we can just add it to the prototype. Um, now, yeah, like I said, like th having that prototype pattern is extremely memory efficient because we don't really have to worry about duplication. But you can also like extend classes kind of like infinitely, in which case it can be pretty difficult to kind of understand where certain properties may be coming from. Um, I don't know if this is clear, but like for example, we have like a border collie, or we have an animal class, and all animals have a name and a cell count. Like that's kind of unique to an animal. Then we also have mammals. Now a mammal is an animal, so it should have all the properties of an animal. But a mammal also drinks milk. So for that specific mammal, we have that drink milk method. And then we have like canine, um, which is a mammal, so it can drink milk. And it has a name and a cell count. And it also has a smell method, uh, and so on, all, all the way down to like dog, which can wag its tail. And then a border collie, which can like herd sheep. So they get like more and more explicit every time, or like uh, unique. Um, but of course, like if we have that new border collie and we uh, get the property of like cell count, it can be like, okay, where did that come from? Like, is that on the border collie? And then you have to go all the way down that prototype chain. Um, now, when I said like you've probably used the prototype pattern many times before, is because like whenever we have, um, I don't know, like uh, any object. So, cause person is name, ah, Lydia. So on this person, you will also find a prototype because all like everything that we create in JavaScript or all the objects that we create in JavaScript automatically inherit from that uh, object prototype. So this is why we have all this functionality that uh, you may have seen whenever we're using any type of like data type on it or on an object um, like to string or value off. So even though we didn't like declare that like on the object itself, JavaScript just gave that to us because it automatically um, it's an instance from the object class. Now the same goes for like I think string. We have uh, all the like primitive data types. I guess if we have name, oh, I guess you cannot really see that like that in the dev tools. But yeah, so that like has like new string. I think maybe this is like a prototype or something. I don't know. I don't know how you can see that in dev tools. But yeah, they all that that's essentially where we get all those built-in methods from. It's from those um, primitive data type uh, prototypes. So what we saw with factory pattern before is that we, um, it, it might have been better like if these objects that we created here had some kind of shared um, properties. I'm just trying to find the, oh yeah, here. I mean, in here, they're all unique. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to use a prototype pattern here because there is nothing to share among all those objects. They're all, they all have unique values. Like book two title is not the same as book three title. Um, but maybe if they had some kind of method, I don't know what method could be on the book, uh, add sale or something, or sell, I don't know, some, something that is shared among all of them, then a prototype pattern would have made sense. Um, yeah, so in ES6, there are actually many ways to create a prototype, either just with a class or with the object.create method. Now I'm only showing the class uh, example here. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, but uh, I'm only showing like examples with a class here, just because it's a bit more more readable, uh, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so I think then we're down to the exercise. So we have a factory function here again, uh, which creates a user, and we only pass the first name, last name, and email. But on every user, we also have some functions or some methods like check last online, send email, and delete. So instead of creating a factory function here. I want you to uh, use the prototype pattern uh, to create those users instead and be a bit more memory efficient with everything. All right, with that, we'll uh, break for lunch. So we'll be back uh, around uh, 120 or so.
All right, well, I think I'll start off with the solution for the prototype pattern exercise in that case. Uh, I'm just going to open this again in Stack Blitz. I'm just going to make the font size a bit bigger. I hope this is big enough. OK, so with the prototype pattern, we, of course, first have to create the constructor that contains all the unique elements. And on this create user vectory function, you can see that the object that gets returned, the first name, last name, full name, and email are all unique. So when we create a new class, we just do class oh, user constructor constructor, which again takes all these um, arguments that we had before. So then we have like this at first name is first name. I see that I made a syntax error here. I make syntax errors everywhere. Okay, this dot last name is last name. This dot email is email, and then we also have a unique full name, which is both of them combined. So this dot full name is Okay, I'm just going to copy paste this there. This dot first name and this dot last name. Now we also have these uh, methods on here that are shared among all the users. So we don't want to put that on the constructor, but instead we want to put that on the prototype. So we can do the check last online, which logs this. Uh, send email, which logs this. And then lastly, we have the delete, which likes that. So now I can remove this function. And instead of uh, calling create user, I can just do a new user and new user. So now when we log, um, I'm just going to log user and user2 first. I will show that other thing later. Let's see if this is all implemented right. Yeah, OK, so now we've got two users. Now one thing you may um, notice, or that's actually pretty fun, is that when we log both the del uh, delete methods or like methods that are available in both of these object prototypes um, or like we can uh, check if they're strictly equal. So if we go to Node.js, you can see that it's true. So even though they are both, um, uh, or OK, no, let me, let me go back a bit. So here, I'm just going to fork this again. So this should be a new one, fork. If we were to do that on the uh, factory function approach, and we uh, checked if they were strictly equal. It's false, because we are creating new functions in memory every time. So the reference to that delete uh, method is uh, like it, it refers to a different uh, place in memory. But on the prototype pattern, because it's using the same uh, prototype, so it's actually all referring to the same one, it's true. So here you can like clearly see, like OK, we've just actually created one delete method instead of two, like we did before with the prototype pattern. Um, so yeah, this is where the whole memory efficiency thing comes in, which is. Uh, Pretty cool. So yeah, this is all we have to do to create the prototype pattern for the users. Any questions on the prototype pattern so far? Cool. Well, I think that kind of concludes the whole design patterns section of this workshop. So we've talked about the module pattern, singleton pattern, uh, proxy pattern, observer pattern, factory pattern, and prototype pattern. But the next one is not so much on like the JavaScript design patterns, but more on React patterns. Uh, and these all talk about how we can use different components, how their data is shared, and just their relationship to each other. So first, let's talk about the container presentational pattern. So with the container presentational pattern, we essentially have two components. I'm just going to make this real quick. We have a container component, which is a component that's solely responsible for retrieving data. And then we have a presentational component, which is solely responsible for showing data, rendering data. So because a container component is only fetching data, it usually doesn't like render any styled components. It just renders one, um, the, the presentational components. So when we look at an implementation here, um, this is using React hooks. By the way, in most of my examples, I will use React hooks. Um, I, I will also cover the hooks pattern so you can kind of see how the different patterns relate to like how we can implement hooks nowadays. So I do like assume that you know how hooks work. But if there are any questions about like these basic like use effects, use state hooks, of course, do let me know. Um, but yeah, so in this implementation, we have the listings container component. So a container component responsible for fetching data. Uh, and we can see that here because it's fetching um, like listings from an API or like a CMS, sets the state to have those listings and then passes them down to the listings component. Um, or like the, the presentational component. I feel like this should have been the presentational component. This may be a typo on my end. Um, yeah, this is a typo on my end. OK, so wait, maybe I can change this. So this should have been like the presentation component. It passes down there. And then the presentation. You want to just like. 
I can't like quickly edit it, but I can just show it. I guess you maybe I'm using it in Stackbook. I can edit, but not like right now. Like I can't redeploy it, but I'm also using it, I guess, down here again. So maybe I can just use it or show it there. It is the solution to an exercise we'll be doing later, but it's worth it. Um, OK, yeah, I'll just do it here. So this is, again, I'm just going to show it in Stackblitz, actually. It's going to increase the font a little bit. So what we have here is we have that uh, listings container component that you saw before. So this one fetches listing from our API, passes it down to this list, uh, listings component, which here is just called listings, which is probably why I made the mistake. Uh, but this is a presentational component. Um, so in here, it retrieves this, the, the listings as props. And the only thing it cares about is rendering that data in a styled way. I'm just getting rid of this grammar. Um, yeah, so that is most of the uh, container presentational pattern. Now, the there are many like trade-offs or like benefits to using this pattern. Um, as you can see, like there's definitely a separation of concerns because the presentational components can be just responsible for the UI, like just the styling of how are we going to render that data, um, whereas the like container components are just responsible for the state uh, of the data of the application. Um, yeah, it's also super easy that way to like reuse these presentational components. Maybe they are using like different data uh, data sources, different data, but they're they're rendered the content the same way. So we can reuse those presentational components, even though they like retrieve different data from from props. Um, it's also nice if you have many presentational components that don't really touch the the fetching logic. So you know, if you just care about the design, or you, maybe you're a designer, you don't really know what gets returned from the API, you can make a lot of changes to these presentational components without maybe accidentally um, like making a mistake with the data, how data is fetched, and all that stuff. Um, now, of course, like hooks, we will see later how hooks kind of replace this pattern a lot of the time. We don't really necessarily have to use this container presentational pattern anymore, or as much as we had to when we used classes, just because it was like more work to like create a class, all that stuff. Um, but we will see that a bit later. All right, so the exercise, even though I kind of already showed you the solution here, but we see an exercise here. Um, so right now, we just have one component. It's called the, the listings component. But in this component, it's not split up into two separate parts. We don't have like a, a container part or a presentational part. It's just one big component. So what I would like you to do is to split this up into two components, a container component and a presentational component. So the container component responsible for fetching the data, and then the presentational component responsible for uh, showing the data. Uh, now you can, I guess, already kind of see, I've already created the folder structure for you. So you have like presentational here and then container here. So yeah, you can just type the container code right in the um, container listings file. Clear? <laughs> Makes sense? All right, perfect. So five minute break? Yeah, that was fine.
All right. So the first thing, all right, I just opened it back up in, in, uh, in Stack Blitz. So the first thing that we see here is that all this data, so the, run, or the fetching data, is now in our presentational component. So we don't want that. So we're just going to move this to our container listings component. I just copied it. I'm just going to paste it. Now, in here, I already imported the listings component from the, the presentational listings um, that's exported here. So I can remove this. And instead, I'm going to expect some props from here, because I'm going to get the listings from props instead of my own data, instead of my own state. Uh, now it, it just shows that, because I haven't passed it there yet. Um, so in here, I have listings. And all I'm going to do is to return listings, the presentational components. And then new listings is data. Data.listings, sorry about that. Let me just get this real quick. There's a caching problem again. Oops. Presentational. I'm going to just props them up. Wait. Listings. Okay, wait, I'm just going to refresh this real quick. I think in app.js, you need to be um, pulling in. Um, listings from container instead of presentational component. Ooh. You are so right. OK, it's from components of container. Yeah, that was it. OK, that was my bad. OK, so now, indeed, yeah, so because we had to render that upper level container component, which of course wrapped that presentational component, it was complaining that it didn't have access to props because we were still rendering that presentational component. Um, yeah, so in here, we're now just fetching the data here and then rendering listings as a presentational component right there. So that's a pretty useful way to, yeah, like I said before, have that uh, separation of concerns. We just have one uh, con or component just responsible for fetching data and the other for pre uh, the presentational side. Questions? Is it common to split the component files into container and presentational folders? I've typically always kept similar files together, like all the listing files and yeah. components listing folder. I don't really think there's a preferred approach. I'm I'm very used to splitting this up into like container and presentational, but everyone has their own way of like naming files, naming folders. Um, I mean, yeah, we could have just uh, moved this back to um, no, okay, well I won't because it just throws an error. We could have just named this like listings container component tsx or listings presentation component. Doesn't matter. Um, personally, I prefer this, but if you prefer anything else, that's completely fine. I don't know if there is like a it, the best way to do it. I think everyone, every developer kind of uses their own way of like folder structure, naming files. All right, perfect. Well, then we go to the next pattern, which is the higher component pattern. So a higher order component makes it really easy to pass logic to other components by wrapping them. Um, for example, like this component, we have like a title component, and we wrap that in with large font size, so it makes it big, and then with bond fold weight to make it uh, to make the font weight bigger or bolder. Um, now, essentially, what a higher order component does is it gets that component that it wraps, and it automatically adds other props to that component, which it then returns. So, for example, here we have a with styles higher order component, and you see here that we're we um, create a style object that has like the color red and then font size um, 1 em. Uh, and then also we're merging props, like in case the component that we're wrapping already had the style prop. We want to make sure that we don't overwrite that. And then we return that component with a new style. So this is pretty useful. I also see that it's like overflowing here a bit. But for example, we just have a text component that just has like the font family enter nothing else. But then we can make a new component really easily with just the or by wrapping it with the with styles higher order component. Um, so again, we have the separation of concerns like we saw before because we have components that just care about adding that data, um, and we. Um, I guess the, the only downside, and although I already showed that before, is that it can easily end up in naming collisions, and you may not always know that. So for in this case, we, um, you know, we add the style prop to the element that we're wrapping. 
but maybe if we um, we didn't like merge the props here, so we just added like the padding and the margin, and this component already had the style, it would overwrite that. And in some cases, when we have that higher order components and we add new props to it, um, we may not always know that this gets overwritten. So sometimes you end up in like unexpected behavior. You're like, why? Why is this prop not what I expect it to be? Um, so that's like the only downside to using higher order components. So if you ever use that, make sure to always merge the props, or at least kind of make sure that you know which props are modified or added to those components. Um, yeah, you can also wrap multiple higher order components. For example, we like we hit, uh, saw here is like the width large font size and then the width bold font weight. So this would have been wrapped twice. Now sometimes it can be difficult to know where certain styles come from or like certain props come from. Of course, it doesn't have to be style. I'll just use that as like a, a simple example here. Um, so yeah, it, it can kind of hinder the readability a bit, making it harder to debug and scale and all that stuff. All right, we're we already have another exercise here. So I'm just going to show what the solution is going to look like. Should look like. So what you see here real quick is that there's a little spinner while it's fetching the data. Now we want to, um, or like preferably we want to reuse that spinner on multiple components of our application. Now in this one, we're just using it here, but this would have been our reason to create a higher order component for this. So what I want you to do is to create a higher order component that adds this width loader, or we can wrap the listings with the width loader higher order components, which adds this spinner while it's loading it. Um, I, uh, as, or I showed some steps here, like fetch the data, show the loading spinner, which we're already like importing here, and then we can uh, pass the fetch data to the, to the wraps component. It's pretty similar to what we did here, so if you need any any inspiration from somewhere? Just uh, take a look there. Clear? <laughs> Perfect.
Okay, ready? Cool. So the very first thing that we're going to do is to fetch the data from the URL that was passed as an argument, because this makes this uh, higher order component super reusable. You know, we're not just fetching from the listings URL, we can li uh, fetch from any URL that we pass to it. So first we just have to use the use effect again. Oh. Fetch URL, then res, res.json, the normal fetch stuff. And then based on this data, we can set the data. We just have data set data. It's react that use state. I'm just going to make this only render on initial. And then if there's no data, so this is kind of where the higher order component logic comes in. Oop, we want to show that loading spinner. Now I am aware that this could also mean that um, there has been an error. So normally you probably also want to account for that, but. In this case, we'll just say, like, if there's no data yet, just return that loading spinner. And otherwise, we will return the element that was passed as this element, so the first one that we wrap the higher order component with, and then also pass this data. Is data. Ah, data. So now, when we go back to listings, we don't want to um, export default the listings, we actually want to import the with loader higher order component first. So with loader from, let's see how far up I have to go. I think it's twice hard with loader, yes. And then in here, I'm going to default, so this component, and it also expected that URL from which to fetch it. So I'm just going to pass this one here. And now it will get this as props. So I don't have to use this anymore. And uh, I believe it will be props.listings. Let's see how deeply fetched that is. I'm just going to check how. Let's see, props data.listings. OK. Props.data.listings. Data. OK, cool. Um, yeah, so now we created our higher order component. And you see this little loading spinner spin when there is no data yet. So even if we have multiple components that maybe fetch from another API, we can easily just reuse this with loader higher order component by simply passing it another URL, and then probably also another component. Um, yeah, so that's really cool thing about higher order components is that they're super reusable, they're super flexible, um, and it makes it really easy to like easily add um, presentational data and also fetching data. Any questions about the solutions so far? Or higher order components in general, really? <laughs> Perfect. Moving on to render props. Just going to scroll up. OK, so the render props pattern um, is, as the name says, we pass props. And those props are actually um, React components. So they're props that we can render. Um, and they make it super easy to like reuse logic across multiple components. So for example, here we have a render prop called uh, render Kelvin and then render Fahrenheit. I'm just going to show this little video. Um, I'll make this big. So we see that the render Kelvin prop and the render Fahrenheit prop are both render props. They are props that render data to the screen. Um, so these, the components that we pass to it, we see like is either a P or maybe a temp card or I don't know what comes after, large text, they all get the um, value prop that we get or that we add here in the temperature converter because we're passing that value here and they receive that back here. So the implementation is, um, I think this example is like exactly like this video here. So this is, for example, then again, the render component, render Kelvin, render Fahrenheit. Um, and the value that we pass here as a prop is then returned here as a prop. So any component that we show here can easily get that value from the uh, input component. Now, the nice thing about this, I don't know where the S is here, uh, um, is that, yeah, the reusability. So what we saw here is that this render Kelvin and the render Fahrenheit, even though they are the same prop, we can always pass a different component to it. So even though we know that they will always render something, what they render can always be different. So it's highly flexible. Um, Again, we have the separation of concerns, but I think the biggest thing for me is that it's the solution that we saw or with the problems that we saw with the higher order components, uh, namely the like implicit props. Because we don't always know with the higher order component what props get modified, um, what props get, m might get overwritten. 
But with the render props pattern, it's super explicit. Like, OK, these are the props that it expects. And these, uh, this is how you render those components. This is the data that they, that they get. Um, now, as with most things, they might sometimes be unnecessary with hooks. We will look at that later. Um, and another thing with render props is that it is any prop that renders data. So if you've used React, you've probably used like the props of children. Children is actually also a render prop. It's a prop that renders data. So render prop doesn't always have to say like render in it or something. It's just a prop that renders any type of data. All right. So we see another challenge here with the refactor of the following code so that the temperature converter uses the render Kelvin and render Fahrenheit props to render the Kelvin and Fahrenheit components. So right now, here we see that this um, example still uses like a Kelvin component and a Fahrenheit component. So it's not using any, any render props. So we're directly passing the value prop here um, from the temperature converter. But instead, we want to have something that is similar to what we saw before, where we could just use this render Kelvin and render Fahrenheit props. So it's not always. Um, this component, but it's more flexible. So try to refactor this code to use the render prop pattern instead.
render prop. Ah, wait one second. Okay. All right. Let's look at the solution. I'll just open it here. Fork it. So first we're going to go to the temperature converter. So instead of just rendering those components as is, we are using the props. So props.render Kelvin. And they are going to provide a prop that is equal to this value prop. So I'm just going to copy paste this calculation here. <laughs> I don't really know that by heart. And then we also have the props.render Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Um, and this value is math.floor, some kind of So now it says not a function because we haven't passed it here yet. Um, so we are exporting the Kelvin and Fahrenheit component here, which we will need in the app.tsx. Um, and here I'm just going to import the Kelvin Fahrenheit that we exported from the same uh, file there. So now we can say render Kelvin. And we saw that we uh, passed this value prop here. So we can now say uh, Kelvin value is value. Let's see. Ooh. And then the render Fahrenheit goes pretty much the same way. So render Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit. Boom, we just got it again. So that's how you would change um, from just uh, rendering regular components, like rendering the Kelvin and Fahrenheit hard-coded into the temperature converter uh, to be render props. So if we didn't want to use the Kelvin here, maybe we just wanted to, uh, I don't know, do like a paragraph. We just say value. And then it would just be like this. like. Ah, nice. I don't know. Yeah, so you can see that it's like super reusable if we ever want to change it or render different components based on maybe the page they're on or the component they're using. Uh, render props can be super, super useful. Any questions so far about the solution, render props? So actually, one thing is that, for example, if you're using React Motion, one thing you'll often see, uh, I just know that this is one of the, um, I just want to go to their documentation, actually. I don't know where I can find that. Um, actually, I'll just do their GitHub. So one um, style that you often see is, let's see if they have it. Yeah, something like this. Now, this is actually also a render prop, like we saw before. But this, uh, this is actually like a child render prop. So sometimes you can see that you know, we're getting those interpolating styles from this um, component, which like in a way would have called like props.child and then or pass those props there. So if you ever see this, you're like, hey, this is actually also render props, which can be very useful. And it's still used by a lot of like animation uh, libraries. And uh, like I think GraphQL uses it as well, or like uh, Apollo. Um, yeah, so you can still see it in the wall pretty often. Question. <laughs> It feels like if there's a set state on app component, it will create a new component for render Kelvin and Fahrenheit on every change of state of the app. Is that correct? It would re-render. Yeah, it would re-render. I mean, yeah, if you're using state and app, it would just re-render all the children that are within that component. So, um, but the same would have happened if we didn't use render props. Like that would have had the same effect because it re-renders all the children within the app component. So whether we are rendering it via a render prop or just regularly through a normal component, it has the same outcome. Um, but yeah, I guess just in general, make sure that if you're using a render prop and the component that you're using isn't like, I don't know, unnecessarily calling state or re-rendering or anything. Uh, but in this case, it would actually end up in, in a similar, or in, in the same results, actually. Well, we've already had three of them, but the hooks pattern is mightiest of them all because they can actually, this one can actually replace <laughs> the first three we just covered in most cases, not in all cases. Um, now, if you've been working with React for I know, at least the past year, I'm sure you've used like hooks, maybe the built-in like use state, use effect, use reducer, all these things. But that's not the only thing we can do with hooks because we can actually also easily create our own custom hooks. Um, for example, uh, this is one example, like if we want to use a use hover hook, we can just create that. So whenever like, a user is hovering that specific card, we can change the state uh, and maybe, I don't know, d log something when they're hovering or show something else. I don't know. We can do anything with hooks. They give us like, all the possibilities. Um, yeah, so one thing that we could do here, or I guess that we 
used to do is to just, I'm just gonna pause this real quick, eh, is to have this all in within this listings component, which works, like this is completely fine. But if we wanna have more components that also use this hovering data, it's just nicer to split this up and to create our own custom hooks so like more components can use this, um, this logic. So right now, if we, we can just use a, or create a use hover hook and then use this in listing, but we can also use it anywhere else in any other component. Oh yeah, I'm actually showing that here. So like if we have an image or a button that also needs this hovering um, implementation, we can just use this use hover hook again. Because one thing to keep in mind is that hooks don't like, it's not like a shared state. They just, um, their way of uh, adding state to any component, but it's not like they're sharing state among the components uh, that, that's using that uh, hook. We'll actually talk about that later with the provider pattern and the compound pattern, because that is a way to share data through hooks. But a hook itself is not a way to like share data. It's just a way to add a stateful logic to a component. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is just the implementation that we kind of just covered, I believe. Oh yeah, well, one thing of course to keep in mind is that whenever you're creating a hook yourself, you have to use use, because these are like the rules of hooks. So React knows that like, okay, it starts with use, this is a hook, I have to treat it in kind of a different way, because uh, there are certain rules that we need to um, uh, use when using hooks in React, just with the way that the React engine works and stuff like that. Um, now, there are many benefits to using, using hooks. It definitely simplifies components a lot, because we can remove that stateful logic from these components, which usually cause uh, components to be way more complex than they should be uh, or need to be, and really just move that all into their own hook. Um, and we can even reuse this stateful logic, which was kind of difficult to do before. I mean, we saw that with like the container presentational pattern, where you know, like we could wrap multiple components in like a container um, component, but now we can we don't have to use that anymore. We can we can just create a hook for that stateful logic. Um, Oh, I, I'm showing that here. So, you know, this would uh, this is using a, a class component, which maybe you're still using. I mainly use functional components, but like we had this container component here that you know fetched those listings, added that state, um, or passed that state back down to the presentational component in order to render it. But with hooks, we can just simplify that a lot. We can just create a hook, maybe call it like use listings that contains all that stateful data, uh, and then that listings component can use that hook like use listings to eventually render that component. So kind of the whole divide between like container presentational doesn't necessarily exist anymore. We don't really have a container, we just have hooks. And since it's so easy to use that in any co or in a functional components, any functional component can really be a presentational component. Um, so that is uh, a great way to write way cleaner code, share this stateful logic across multiple components. But yeah, like I said before, the rules of hooks is just something that you need to kind of learn. And this is also in their documentation. Um, and actually, it will throw an error if you're using hooks kind of like out of order. Like you cannot render a component and then use a hook. It needs to all be like on the top of the component, stuff like that. Um, but honestly, once you know that, it's, it's pretty fair to use. It's nice. It's maybe something to get used to if you haven't used it before. But after that, it's, it's pretty, pretty nice. OK, so here we actually used a solution that we had before with the container presentational pattern. And like I said before, hooks can definitely replace that whole structure. Um, so for this challenge, I would like you to refactor this example that's using this container presentational pattern and use a hook for that in, instead. So if you need to get any inspiration, um, I guess it's pretty similar to what we have here. So yeah, I guess create a use listings hook or Name it anything you want, as long as it starts with use. <laughs> Question. So what is the difference between the use custom hook versus uh, 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 creating a reusable component? Um, well, it, it just simplifies things. I think if you create a reusable component, of course, you, we can also like add state to that, like we did with a, like a container component. Could, I guess, be like a reusable component that contains state. Um, it's just harder to use that across an application and not end up with like nesting issues or uh, like prop drilling. Like maybe you need m to have many components that need props. You need to wrap that around every time, if that makes sense. Um, so a hook makes it really easy to get data in even the smallest component, which we'll also cover in like the provider pattern, um, which kind of share or talks about like shared states. Um, but like if you're just using maybe a single 
state, like maybe in, in this case listings, it would have been fine to use like a container components. Um, but in some cases, maybe with like a use hover, it would really make sense to wrap every component that needs hover logic within another component, like readability, um, scalability, all those things. But it, it works. Like with most things, it works. So it's not like don't do that. Um, but I think once you've used a hook for that, it yeah, it, you can see how much easier it is to use uh, and more readable. So we only have exercises for the provider and compound pattern. Afterwards, there are no exercises anymore, so <laughs> don't worry.
All right, let's look at the solution for this one. So the first thing I'm going to do is I always like to create a new folder just called hooks. And in here, I'm going to create a new um, file called use listings.tsx. Now I'm just going to move the data that we have here, the stateful data, over to this hook. So I can do export default function use listings. We have here, I'm just going to import React real quick. Um, and then here, I'm just going to return, um, actually, I'll just, yeah, return the data. Could have called it listings, but I'll just call it data. So now we can use this hook uh, throughout our application. So let's see, instead of here, uh, let's see, where am I getting the props? Did I just have it? Or not? Uh, yeah, here. So instead, I'm going to do like presentational. Or actually, I'll just uh, use it from uh, deuterium listings instead. There are just multiple ways to do it, but I'm just going to do it here. Reason. No, actually, I'll do it here. Sorry about that. Import use listings from hooks. Use listings. Hopefully, I import it from the right folder here. Hey, we go. Now, for example, we can say use uh, listings is use listings. We can pass the props here again. So listings, listings, listings. But this time, because now it's still using that like container, um, I don't want that. I just want to have this one. So I'm going to import listings from the presentational one. Listings from presentational. Let's see. Use listings. Oh, because I'm passing listings here in its data. Let's see. Where am I using listings? Listings is not defined. I think you have to deconstruct the object return from listings. Ooh, let's see. In app, the app. Let's see what's going on here. Well, it says it's not defined. So normally that's like whenever you have um, a variable on line 14. Oh, that's no. always a fun one. You need to wait for it to come back. <coughs> so here like it returns the data where uh, in the app component you are taking as a oh. listing. So we have to make sure this makes sense. So in here we again have to make sure that there are listings available because normally we are like, if there's no data, then render nothing. If there is data, then render something. Um, that's right, I forgot about that. So return null. So then, yeah, I think we have to return, if you call it listings, you'd have to say listings.listings. Oh, gotcha, okay, all right, okay. Sorry, it is late, or at least late <laughs> for me. <laughs> yes, I had to I had to destructure it, sorry about that. Um, well, I mean, I could either say like return data or just return data listings and then, yeah, you get it, you get it, just destructuring thing. But yeah, so this is how you could use a hook. We can either use it here in app or we could have used it directly in the listings component here, in the presentational components, which in most cases, because like here in app, you probably have way more components, so you probably don't want to use the hook up here because every time listing changes, every time we re-render the page, all the components will get re-rendered. Um, so we could have done like listings, maybe use listings like in here. And then again, we have to say like, if no listings, then return no, or that nice little loading spinner that we had before. But then here we can actually just remove this. We don't need this anymore. Then we just need to import the hook and listings here. So import use listings from hooks, use listings. Oh, we again have to destructure it, I guess. Listings.listings.map. Dot, listings dot okay, there you go. So uh, in this case, you can see that we can easily create kind of like modularized components that all use that listings data. Now we could use this hook anywhere in our code that maybe also needs this listings data. Um, yeah, so this is just like a nice way to easily, I don't know, have stateful logic, uh, in this case, a fetch. And the nice thing also about hooks is just for this specific example, uh, when I'm fetching data, I usually like to use something called uh, SWR. I wonder if I can, oh, I actually already imported it. Uh, this is a really nice like fetching library that also use hooks. So I can use import like use SWR from SWR. And for example, I could do like data error loading, or actually I think it's just data and error right now. They just updated their API, is used SWR. And then this, and then you just need to add some fetcher logic with a sort of fetcher. I always forget that um, uh, here, const fetcher. Oop. 
So the nice thing that we see here is that the community can create so many um, hooks that, and again, so this is actually using the same data now. Now, SWR is actually also adding some fetching logic like stale while revalidate. It automatically caches the response. So instead of like calling it on every render, um, we just get it from cache first if it hasn't been invalidated yet, all that stuff. But I just wanted to show you this because there are, I think there's even a website called like React Hooks or something. Uh, OK, I should have looked this up first. I don't know. It's some website call. And you just have like this library of so many ho hooks that like the community used, and you can use it for so many different use cases. So instead of thinking, like, how can I add the stateful logic to my component in a performant way, you could just import them from like NPM in your node modules. So uh, it makes stuff a lot easier. And if, like, it's kind of like a plug, -in, plug and play um, architecture almost. But yeah, anyway, that was it on hooks. Now, to uh, are there any questions so far on hooks, or are we good? Perfect. The person just said they renamed hooks, renamed the hook to use data. Use data instead of instead of what? Use listings. Oh, gotcha. Okay, yeah, yeah. You can use you can use any any name as long as it starts with with use. I mean, yeah, like uh, if, if my state was called data, like I had here, I mean, I could have said like listings, set listings, return listings. I like to use use listings. If I had like data, set data, return data, you know, so you use data. I like to kind of keep that in sync with the state I'm setting, what's the name of the state, what's the data I'm returning. But yeah, that's uh, all up to you. But the next one is the provider pattern. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, can I ask Oh, question? no worries. Yeah, sure. Um, I was just thinking about the example we did for the higher order components with the loader. Um, yeah. And I'm just thinking about like how that would convert to hooks or like how you would combine it with what we just did with the yeah. these listings. I mean, one thing that we could do here is I don't, I don't know if I have that little component. But what we could do is maybe have another state here called like uh, cons loading set loading or something. Sure. Um, and then we can say like if loading, loading, I don't have that state right now, so it'll throw an error, but throw like reloading spinner or something. Oh, sure, just um, okay. Yeah. OK. But the provider pattern, this is kind of where hooks. Oh, wait, um, one more comment. OK. <laughs> uh, someone just linked to usehooks.com. Oh, yeah, usehooks.com, exactly. I knew. Yeah, so this is the one I use so many times for like the smaller things, like use toggle. You can see all those, uh, like how they used hooks in this case. Um, there's also some like yeah, like some for like uh, npm libraries or note modules that you can just import. Um, but these are really good examples of how you can use hooks, or if you ever just need, I don't know, anything that's that's listed here. Um, let's see, like use auth. The, Use event listener. This one's really useful. I usually also use like use local storage and all that stuff. Um, use why did you update? Yeah. So yeah, you can be super creative with with hooks, which is uh, which is fun. But yeah, so if you want to share stateful logic throughout your application using hooks, um, you can use the provider pattern, and this is kind of a combination between the context API and um, well, you don't have to use hooks, but we'll see later that that's definitely uh, a nice extra. So with the provider pattern, we can say, or for example, we have like this site again, and we want to have like a dark mode and a light mode. So all the components on that website need to know, OK, what's the current theme? Like it needs to get th that data from somewhere. Um, now, usually, I'm just going to go here real quick, is what happens is when we want to implement logic like this, we end up with something called prop drilling. Uh, for example, if we have that state in a very high component like the app component, and the listings all the way down the the component tree need to know that we have to like pass it. It was like props theme. This is called prop drilling. Um, you've probably seen this before, where you just like pass a component props, and that component has a child component. You have to pass props there, which has a child component. All that stuff. Um, now this can be super difficult to work with, and it's bad for like readability. You just don't really know where stuff goes, where it comes from. Um, all that stuff. Now, the context API in uh, React uses a bit or is a bit different. So instead, we can wrap the components that actually need the data in something called a provider. And these components, if they need to have that data um, that, or that stateful data, they can opt in to use that context. If they don't, that's fine. Because um, another thing that we saw with prop drilling is every time the state changes, I'm just going to scroll up a bit in app. All the components re-render, even the components that don't care about the data. 
this is, of course, something that we want to avoid. But sometimes it's pretty hard to avoid that, especially when many components care about the data like further down the tree. Uh, but the like, stateful logic comes from higher up. But yeah, so with the provider pattern, we can wrap the components that care about it, or at least the, the parent most components um, that has all the children that care about it in a provider. And this provider provides a React context, which is essentially a component, like a stateful component, um, that um, other components within the provider can opt in to consume that data. So we have like a provider and we have consumers. Um, for example, here we have like the theme context. This is just the kind of based on the example that we saw earlier. So for example, now we have like state lights by default, um, but we also have like a, a theme and then set it. Now the landing page can be wrapped in uh, the provider because the components within the landing page care about this data somewhere further down the tree. Maybe not top nav directly, maybe not main directly, but somewhere down there they care about this data. Um, now in this case, top nav does care about it. It's a consumer. Um, so here we again see a render prop. Uh, so it uh, gets the, the theme component that we passed here as a value from the provider. So that is essentially like that uh, context. So they can consume this context, and based on the state changes that we make in the provider, we can either have a background color of light or dark. Um, and then we can also have a toggle that uses the set theme um, uh, state update. So even though we see that main itself doesn't care about, like we don't have any components with main, but maybe the toggle is like within main. But we don't have to care, or we don't have to worry about the re-render of main if the theme provider update it because it doesn't directly consume it. Only the components that consume it directly will update on a state update. Um, so, oh yeah, this is kind of where the hooks come in because it's really nice to combine this with React hooks. So, for example, if we have a theme context, which is just the you know like stateful object. Um, and we have the provider here, which uh, I like to just create a direct like component for it. You don't have to do that. You can also just wrap it directly in like this provider here. But I just like to export it as provider so it's like the same everywhere. Uh, and then we can also create a custom hook that's called like uh, use theme context because one of the built-in uh, hooks within React is the use context hook. Um, and this is the way that other components can opt in to consume the values of the provider. But this just makes it a bit more clear. Like, OK, this is just a use theme context uh, hook. So now, for example, the top nav cares about the theme. So instead of using this, sorry, I, if I'm scrolling too much, let me know. But instead of using like this component and then this render prop, which is fine, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's not too pretty, we can also just use this hook, like the use theme hook. So anytime that theme updates, it actually also just gets it the same way that we saw before. Same with toggle. Um, because it also exposes that set theme toggle. Um, yeah, so this is a really nice way to use hooks, but this time in like a stateful context. So we're actually using it to change state or to uh, consume state. Um, yeah, so one thing just to keep in mind is that if, if, if your component doesn't necessarily care about uh, what the provider context or of, I guess here what the yeah, what the context uh, provides. Just make sure that you don't accidentally end up using it, because that will cause a re-render. Um, but yeah, so only the components that actually consume it, which is which is pretty nice. Uh, yeah, and of course, it's, it's better for like scalability, because we don't run into that render props issue where it's hard to know where certain props come from. It's just nicer. It's, it's way more readable, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, we can see that here. So we have another challenge. So the application below contains a listings component and an input component. I know this CSS is really bad in smaller viewports, but here you see that this input component uh, uses the listings as well. Um, I'm just going to show, I'm going to make this a bit bigger. So what we have here is we have this input component. And we're again using that use listings hook that we saw before. Um, in order to render the, the listings here. I know it's really bad CSS, but to render the listings here. However, we're also using this component in the listings. So what ends up happening, and I'm just going to open this in a new tab, is that we're unnecessarily fetching the listings twice, which you can, I guess, see. Let me just reload this. I don't know if web container hard reload is the way to go. Oh, yeah, here. Um, yeah, so we, you can see that it fetched it twice, because we're calling use listings twice, both in the input 
and in the listings uh, components. So instead, what I would like you to do is to create a provider that wraps both the input and the listings and that consumes this or that uses this use listings hook, but it makes sure that it just fetches it once because it can pass it down or it can provide it to these consumers, the input and the listings. So we don't accidentally fetch it twice for, for no reason. All clear? <laughs> Make sense? All right. <laughs> Maybe a little longer. I don't so we, we got like the two sections to go through, but you're using that because they don't have exercises that are going to go fast. Yeah, I I guess so. Um, I mean, there I like I like the rendering patterns, but there isn't like too much to I guess ask. I mean, maybe there is, but to like ask about and oh, same with like performance patterns. Like here, we're just going to talk about like bundlers and compiling and like how we can import it based on like webpack. Um, but yeah, I feel like these will go pretty pretty fast. Perfect. OK. So the first thing that I like to do is to put all the like providers, anything with context, in a separate folder called context. You don't have to do that. It's just what I personally prefer. If you like anything else, feel free to do that. Um, now here, I'm going to do a listings provider. And in here, I'm just going to import React from React. And I'm also going to import the use listings hook, because this is essentially what we're, we'll be using afterwards. Use listings, hopefully I, yep. Now I'm going to tap the listings provider. Uh, and this one is going to uh, use this use listings hook because it needs to fetch those listings. Um, I'm just going to say, like, if no listings, then return null. Or loading spinner. I don't have that component right now. Normally, I would have added a nice spinner. Um, and otherwise, return the context that we're going to create now. So here is like const listings context is react.createContext. And the initial value is null. Like, we don't have anything yet. It's kind of just like an empty object. Um, so here we can say, OK, so from this context, I want to have the provider. And the value that we pa want to pass to the consumers are the listings. And here I'm going to use props of children. Sorry, props of children. And then listings context.provider. Boom. Now, uh, like a Set before, I like to create a custom hook for this. So maybe like function use listings context and then return reacts dot use context. So this hook lets us consume the context that we're providing uh, to the children of the listings provider. So that is listings context. Cool. Now the parent most component that wraps both the input and the listings is in app. So we need to go back here and import this provider from. Uh, context listings provider, listings provider, not listing. And we are just going to wrap that here. Cool. So now we just need to update the input component. I don't want it to use the use listings hook. Instead, I wanted to use the use listings context hook. Context. Use, uh, sorry, uh, listings provider. Provider. Uh, so in here, I get this. Oh, it is a named export. And I also have to change that in listings. So I'm going to say use listings context from uh, context listings provider, or listings context. And then we're going to use that here. Now, I don't really have to uh, show that anymore, because we the provider already renders null uh, if there is no data, and that reps that component. So right now, we have access to the listings. 
through this context that we provide in this provider. So we're only calling use listings once. And the data that we get from that, we're passing to both, well, to all the, to any child component that would like to consume it. But in this case, we're only consuming it here in input and then again in, in listings. So this is a really nice way of sharing data um, across multiple components and making sure that, especially here, like if you're fetching data or something, to minimize like the amount of API calls, because that can get pretty, well, both laggy and expensive as if, if it's your own API, um, stuff like that. So yeah, this is a pretty easy way to, uh, to use the provider pattern uh, and to, to share data across multiple components. Any questions about the solution? Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and let's say the context is pretty complex. It's got a lot of returns, right? Yeah. Um, if, but I'm only consuming one of them, and context updates something else that I'm not consuming, am I not going to re-render, or is it an all or nothing thing with context? Um, as far as I know, so for example, right now we're actually returning listings, but maybe this is like a, um, a an object. I just have to change this real quick, otherwise it's going to freak out a bit. Listings. Um, but maybe we also had another value in here. I don't know. It could be. Uh, data set data is react.use state. And let me know if this doesn't answer your question. But maybe we also have like data in here. Now, if data updates, but the input is only consuming listings, it will not re-render. So only the consumers that also use that data will re-render. I may be mistaken here, but this is the last thing that I learned. Uh, so if that's not right, do let me know. But uh, yeah, it will only re-render if you're actually consuming the updated value. Any more questions? Um, so this is using like the built-in React stuff, like create context and whatever. Is there kind of like a more generic idea of a provider? Provider pattern? pattern? Pretty much like, at least in the context of React, like you would just always use Yeah, when we're talking about React and we're talking about the provider pattern, this okay. is definitely like the pattern that we're thinking about. Um, I think in like in general, let's see what like defines a provider pattern. I don't know if that's like make data available to multiple child components. Um, so it could really be any like wrapped component. I guess it passes data in like an easy way to multiple child components. Um, but when talking about React, and I, I'm not entirely sure like what defines a, the the provider pattern. Maybe in other languages you can use like other tools. I'm not entirely sure. I don't dare to make any <laughs> statements there. People are like, no, that's not true. Um, but yeah, with React, it's it's always with like the context API, and uh, if you want to use hooks, like I did here, use hooks, but you don't have to. So, cool. It was a it was a question on my notes. Oh. Um, that was um, in a complex app, you might have lots of providers. So you just do you wrap your app with all providers, or just certain components in that case where you've got a bunch? Of yeah, yeah. I mean, in this case, I'm wrapping it in within this app just because like that's the parent most component that b shares children that both need this input. But always try to make sure, and also like you can wrap this multiple times um, if the data doesn't have to be shared. For example, if I wrap this in like the input listings, now this will create two different providers for each of them. I don't. Um, so like I could, if you want to reuse certain data in like smaller sections of your application, you can totally do that. And that's also obviously, um, Way more performant. Like, m try to make sure that you're only wrapping the parent most component that you know, sh or the kind of the common ancestor component. I don't know if that makes sense, um, but don't unnecessarily wrap your application in like all those providers. Even though you know it will only update if it consumes it, it can still cause like unexpected re-renders, um, and it also makes it like a lot more readable to understand like which parts, which component parts are consuming certain data. Um, yeah. Please. I'm, I'm a little bit lost here. Um, when, when previously I didn't uh, define right. When I, whenever I used a provider, the child component to be interested in it has to have a consumer portion of it. Yeah. So and that uh, was. Um, let's see. So you can either use the. I guess this is what you're referring to, right? Yeah. So you can either use this, or you can use the use context hook. So this is like. Either or, but personally, I prefer to use the use context hook just because it's a bit smaller. Um, it's personally more readable to me. But feel free to use the this render props pattern with the with the consumer. Yeah. All right. Then moving on to the compound pattern, which is still using the provider pattern, by the way. So maybe also if you still have questions, this might clear some things up. 
But with the compound pattern, we can create multiple components that work together to perform a single task. Um, and this is very nice to use with the provider pattern. So for example, here we want to click on the search. And again, this opens like that, that search bar. Now, essentially what happens here is that the search bar and this um, kind of like flyout, they all work together. Like all those components are performing a single task. Like the user clicks on the input, then this input shows these list items. Um, so we could wrap all these components within a provider that provides that data or that state to know like, OK, is this list item open? Uh, or is, is the list open? Has the user clicked on it? All that stuff. Um, now, often what you see with the compound pattern, and maybe you've used this in uh, like component libraries, is that we can import like a, symbol, uh, a single component or like a visual component. And then we can use like dot notation, like flyout.input, flyout.list to conditionally render the components that this compound component provided. Hope that was not too confusing. Um, so for example, here we have like the flyout.input, which I tried to make like here, and flat list, list item. Now you can see here that we don't have any state um, in the search input itself, because that state is um, contained within the flyout itself. So we can see kind of the implementation here. Um, and we will, of course, have an exercise that also makes you do this. But so the flyout component here, so that's like the parent that wraps all those um, smaller components, that's a stateful component. And that provides, it is, or yeah, so we, we create a context again, like we did before with the provider pattern. And this returns a provider that has the open toggle value and a set value method. Just for this example, of course, you can pass anything. Um, and then that renders the children. Now, any of those children can then use this context or use the consumer uh, component um, to retrieve the value or to toggle or to set the value to open all the values that we provided here in this provider. Now, the cool thing about the compound pattern is that you can also just say, like, like flyout.input is this input component, flyout.list is this list component. And that makes it super easy or, yeah, to create like those subcomponents because we only have to have like one single import, like we saw here. We can just do like import flyouts, and we don't have to also import like flyout input, flyout list, flyout list item. Um, you don't have to do that with the compound pattern, but it definitely makes it clear like, okay, this is just one component, and all these subcomponents they just like work together. It's just like part of a one bigger component. It's not like a standalone uh, component on its own. Yeah. Um, now here we see that we're just uh, rendering it right away. One other way that you might often see it is using like the rec children map with the clone element. So instead of directly rendering like props of children, um, with, like wrapped within that provider, we can also just map all the children and directly pass the the props or like the these props, the open toggle value set value, the same uh, like value that we provided to the provider before, <laughs> but we now pass it directly as props. Um, so you can see here like props and then like on focus, on blur, children, all those things. So yeah. Um, let's see. I guess this is just an example. Oh yeah. So here we're using like, uh, it's basically just a, a real version of the example that we saw before in the animation. So we have like uh, San Francisco, Seattle, Austin, Miami, all that stuff. And we can easily render that here. So we're just importing the flyouts. We have the flyout input. And we can, like, if we want to, we could just add more items. I don't know, have multiple boulders for no reason. Uh, and then ha we have that. So it's super easy to like add um, new components. And if you are using maybe a component library or something, those components are usually styled. You see this in like Material UI, probably many other ones as well. Um, but yeah, we don't have to care about the styling of the components or the state. So it's super easy to render components, stateful components, but in, in a very easy, straightforward way. Um, yeah, so the trade-offs, like the pros are kind of what I just talked about. Having that single import, which is super nice. We don't have to explicitly import all those child components as well. Um, and yeah, so the state management. So any component that uses such a compound component doesn't have to implement its own state, because that's already contained within that compound component. Um, now, the only kind of drawbacks is, I guess, when you're using rec children map, you just have to be more careful with how you're rendering those children, because uh, it's like only direct children will then get access to like all the props that we pass. Um, but 
yeah, that's just kind of like implementation details. Same with the naming collisions. Uh, maybe you, you, or the child components that we pass already have props that we're then passing um, when using rec clone elements because it's only performing like a shallow merge. But again, that's, that's about it. All right, so the last challenge of today, as far as, far as I know, is to create a compound pattern or a compound component. So here we see that we have uh, an input component. I'm just going to make this big real quick, one sec. OK, so in this input component, we see that we have you know, the stateful logic, like open, set, op, set, open, value, set, value, toggle. And this one is, um, or this input component is rendering the flyouts. Now, you can see that this is not a compound component. Like, we are actually creating all those children ourselves. So instead, what we want to get is something like we saw before. Like, we just want to be able to import a flyout and then render a flyout.input, input list, list item. So change this code to create a flyout component that the um, input component returns, if that makes sense. Clear? And of course, like if you need any inspiration, just scroll up a bit, and you will probably see the implementation. What, five, seven minutes like that? Seven or something, yeah. Seven minutes.
Okay, let's look at the solution for this provider pattern or a compound pattern exercise. So the first thing that I like to do is to create just a separate um, file where we're going to store this component. Um, and I'm actually just going to move a lot of functionality from input to flyout. So don't get confused now. I'm just going to copy paste. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to, I'm going to get rid of this. So I'm going to create like a flyout context. Flyout context is react.createContext. This is going to keep track of the state of our flyouts or our, yeah, our, our compound component to see if it's open, values, stuff like that. Then we're going to create the flyout, which is just going to be like the provider. So the first thing that we're going to do is like return dot provider. Um, it doesn't auto close. I'm used to like that it auto closes. I guess then props at children is going to get props here. And the value that we pass here is again like that um, functionality that we see here. So we want to get the open toggle um, yeah so we have the open set open um, value or uh, yeah value set value or I guess we just have toggle actually because that uses the set open okay cool so now we have this flyout which I'm just going to export and then we also want to add what else was it like the flyout that input and list and list item so the flyout that input export function, or actually it can just be a function input, which is also going to get props. So this one is going to consume the provider that we just created here. So I need like the value toggle set value is react.use context. I could have just created a separate hook for this, like use flyout context, but I haven't done that. Um, so here, which then again returns this input. Uh, yeah, return input. Now this is already like using like the toggle value, set value, all the stuff that we had before. Um, and then I also need to create a list. Again, gets props. Uh, this one just needs to know if the if it should be open or not. So that's also get passed here. Open. Return open. Let's see how we added that here. So we have the open fly up list. I'm just going to copy this. I don't, wait, did I include the open there? I think I did. Yeah. Return open. Now it doesn't care about the actual listings, it just needs to render this UL and then the children that we eventually pass to it, or props of children, sorry. And then we also need to create a list. Oh, I think I, there. And then we also have an item, props, and that is just going to be this little list item here. Um, and this needs the, doesn't need a key. This needs to know the props of children. Um, ah, okay, props. And then we're going to use the set value from this context. So we're going to get set value. Oh, I need to return it, obviously. Return. So I'm just going to add another prop here. It's going to be like props of value. This is kind of similar to what we saw in these examples, just to make it easier to like set the value. Wait, now it's going to find it. This value to essentially, or to eventually set the state. So on mouse down, so when we click it, we set the value to that props of value that we pass. Um, all right, so now we have the list, the item, and the input components. And it's throwing an error now because it's like duplicate. But to make this a compound component, we just need to say like, okay, flyout.input, flyout.input is equal to the input component, flyout.list is equal to list component, and flyout. I think I probably didn't have the, yeah, flyout.list um, item is item, for example. All right, so now we have our compound component, the flyout component. So we now we created the context. The flyout itself is a provider, like we saw before. So this one contains the state and passes it down to any children. And we see that the children here, they use this context, they consume this context, which they can then in turn use. So in the input component, um, we can now just import this flyout. Fly out from fly out. Hopefully I exported it. I may have forgotten to do that. Oh. Okay, no, I did not. Um, so we can just do return. I'm just going to write it here. Flyout. Oh. 
flyout. Now first we have the flyout.input. Now this doesn't need any props or anything. We're just rendering the input right now, um, which you can see here. Like it's just the input. Um, but then we also want to render the, the list, which is you know, attached to that input. So we have the flyout.list. And within this list, we want to render these uh, li uh, list items. Now these list items are based on the listings that we map here. So we can still use this part. But then instead of just um, rendering uh, a list item here, we do flyout.listItem. Flyout.listItem. Cool. So now we just set the value is listing.name. We don't need this anymore. We also don't need that. We do need a key because you know we're still mapping over React components. And it also expected this um, value prop here in, uh, in flyout. So now, let's see. Return. We can get rid of all of these things. Let's see. OK, so now when we refresh, <laughs> wait, where did it go? Um, let's see. Are we rendering the flyout input list? Flyout the list equals list. Let's see if it's open or not. True. Flyout dot list. Wait, maybe I don't have the right like CSS selectors here. Let's look at the solution right here. It could also just be a stack list thing again. This is like the, the solution that I wrote down here is the exact same state as where I left the other one off. So don't, don't worry. Um, so we again have this flyout. And in here, yeah, so we, we are not actually using this. So um, here in the input, like one thing about the compile component is that we can just use these return components like whatever we want. Like if we want to somehow render like three inputs, we could do that if we want to. Um, Dude, SecBlitz is not my friend today. Anyways, normally you would see three input components just because it doesn't matter, like it doesn't care about the component itself. It will just render whatever we pass as children. So this is, or the compound pattern is a really nice way to create those dynamic, flexible, stateful components uh, and kind of have this like plug and play um, method that you will, like I said, often see in like those component libraries. Um, but yeah, so this is a, like a really good example of where it's useful for like smaller contexts to use the provider pattern because it was super easy for us to just create a context and share the state with so many child components. We don't know what the child components are, what, what they are, because we can dynamically render them. Um, and we, like the child components only care about certain values. So it's really nice to um, like destructure them from, from the context that way. Yeah. Any? Any questions? <laughs> I know this is like a lot to take in because it's like a combination of many things that we just covered. So I completely understand if it's still a bit like, okay, but why would you use it? Of course, also like this website will always be online. So if you ever want to read back what we did today, feel free to check that out. Sure. Yeah, what's the question? Um, can we use the memo and use callback uh, to avoid like re rendering issues? It depends on like the data that you're getting, but yeah, usually you can use use memo and use callback um, to ensure that we aren't like unnecessarily updating the state. In this case, um, I mean, this is not specific to like the compound pattern. This is just like specific to I guess hooks in general. Um, in some cases, you may not necessarily need to like re-update a hook if the end result stays the same. In that case, we can like memoize the results. Um, or memoize the actual function that we pass to the like use callback to make sure that we don't like generate another hook for that specific or create another function for that hook if that makes sense. I'm really bad at explaining those two hooks um, because they are so like specific. But once you know the difference between like use memo and use callback, because they kind of use or they return the same result, like they have the same use case. But use callback um, expects a function, whereas use memo expects a value, as far as I know. Um, but yeah, no, they, these are very useful hooks if you are using data that are within a component that shouldn't re-render too often. Uh, but if it's hi like highly dynamic data, make sure that you're not using use memo where it shouldn't, because then you might actually end up with the opposite, where you're like, why is my data not updating? Why is my component not updating? Is because it's using like a memoized value. But um, 
yeah, those are two. Those are like the, the built-in hooks. I mean, if you get get started with hooks, definitely make sure to check them out because like the React itself, like the React core team, they expose so many useful hooks that you can use to create, like or to get a really good performance website. Um, so you don't have to use like all the community hooks. But uh, it's definitely good to know what's out there and what you can use to, uh, to create performance uh, component, stateful components. Because of course, that's always an issue with React. Like, does it re-render too often? Like, where do I put the state? But uh, yeah, it's a different way of thinking about things with hooks, I guess. All right. Well, I guess that concludes the section on React patterns. So we still have two sections, but they're kind of different. They're not patterns like we discussed with like the design patterns or the React patterns. They're more like ways of thinking about how do we, well, A, like um, render our website, which is here, the rendering patterns. And then also just like how do we use like the imports, like the modules that we saw before um, with the module pattern. And what are all the steps that our code um, takes or has to take before a user can actually see it? And how can we optimize for that? So that is going to be the next sections. I, yeah, I don't know if there should be a break in between or not, but <laughs> otherwise I can just I keep on. OK, cool. In the case, before we start with performance patterns, um, let's just talk about everything that is, uh, or everything that we need to do before we can actually ship it to the user. So any client-side JavaScript in our application has to you know, get shipped to the client in one way or another. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that it can do a couple of things. Well, the first thing, of course, is that it has to be executable in a browser environment. Because the fact that it works in our VS code doesn't necessarily mean that all browsers uh, support the syntax that we're using. Um, and we also want to make sure that the JavaScript that we're fetching is not too large. You know, We don't want to have a huge bundle that takes a long time to download, use user bandwidth, um, that eventually costs the users a lot of money and stuff like that. So in order to do this, we use bundlers. Now, there are many like bundlers out there. Um, but what a bundler does is it bundles our application into one or multiple files, like depending on your configuration. Uh, and this makes it possible to execute or make our code like executable in other environments as well based on your configuration. So well, essentially what a bundler, bundler does is it has like a config file. In this case, I'm using Webpack, but there are many others out there. I will also list them later on. Um, but it has an entry file. And it starts to bundle your code from that entry file, so it looks like or in this example, it's the entry point is index.js, which imports module 3, which imports module 2, which imports module 1. So it starts to look at index.js as like, OK, I see that you want to use module 3 from the module 3 file. Cool. I'll make sure to bundle that in the index.js because it's going to need it. And then module 3, in turn, um, imports module 2. So it also makes sure that it's in there as well. So we don't like have a bundle of JavaScript code with, that references things that aren't available. So that is like the main um, goal of a bundler, is to make sure that the bundle that we're creating has all the code that is necessary to run that certain, uh, certain script, certain page, stuff like that. Uh, now, like I said, there are a few popular bundlers. Uh, in these examples, I will just use Webpack, just because it's right now the most commonly used one. But maybe you've also heard of like Parcel, Rollup, which are also great bundlers. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be using Webpack in the following examples. Then we also have compilers. So a compiler converts JavaScript uh, or TypeScript into like a version of JavaScript that browsers could run. Now, of course, maybe uh, it depends on your configuration, but in some cases, you know that your users are still on like Internet Explorer or something. Now that browser basically supports almost nothing. So even though we want to use like the latest features in JavaScript, we have to make sure that we can use a compiler that turns our code into executable code that can run in Internet Explorer. Because obviously, we don't want to write our code and always think about, OK, what am I writing? Is that like, can I use that? Is that executable in the browsers that my users use? We just want to use the latest um, technologies. We want to use the latest JavaScript features. So yeah, a compiler is, is great for that. Uh, an example here is like using private classes. So for example, I don't know if I should zoom in here or not, but we have like a secret manager. And this uh, is pretty new syntax here. We can actually use like private uh, values within classes. Now, obviously, a lot of browsers do not support this yet. So if we were to fetch this file in a browser, the browser would be like, I don't know what to do this. Like, I, don't, I cannot interpret this. I don't know what to do. So a common or a, a well-known transpiler here is, for example, Babel. Uh, which then turns this code. And based on your configuration, it's like, OK, I can make this code executable. Um, 
still so you can write it in the latest way, but I will transform it into a way that your browser will also understand, but still resulting in the same end result. Um, now, as yeah, so a compiler doesn't bundle code. Like that's what the bundler does. It just transforms it into another for, uh, version based on a certain configuration. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've used TypeScript. That's also a compiler because there's like TypeScript into a certain version of JavaScript. So, but in, in the following examples, I'll probably be using Babel or TypeScript. I'm not sure. Both are great. Uh, and then there's also the minifier because. Um, as you can see here, even though like the code that we wrote was pretty small and concise, the or the result of the um, compiler was pretty big because we have like so much code. It needs to add all these other functionality in order to make it executable in the browser. Um, now, one like minifier is, for example, Terser. And when you're using Webpack, you can also add like Terser uh, plugins and stuff like that. So like the bundler automatically takes care of also minimizing that code or minifying, sorry, that code. Uh, for example, in production. So we can make sure that the code that we write is super readable. We don't really have to think too much about, do I really want to add that function? This might like increase the bundle size for our users, because a minifier will take care of that and will make sure that it's super, super small. For example, here, like function t, uh, I have no idea what that is. But this all still refers to like these functions ooh, that we saw like here. It just changes the name, stuff like that. So yeah, this makes sure that our bundle size is very small. Now, popular minifiers are like Terser or Aquify. Now, in 2022, there are also many tools out there that combine all the stuff that we just talked about. So they bundle, they compile, and they minify. For example, SWC, which is a Rust-based compiler. It's also super, super fast. Uh, and then there's also ESBuild, which is a Go-based compiler. Um, so that's pretty nice, because then we don't really have to you know, think about, OK, this is our Webpack config. This is our Babel config. How does that all work together? We can just use one. Um, it's just that they don't support as many things as Webpack does at the moment. So it's still sometimes nicer to like, use Webpack until maybe they add support for certain things later on. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely nice that right now people are working on adding those combinations, because this is always a pain to set up when you're starting to work on a project. Sorry, we have a library here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> About the <coughs> from which part on? <laughs> yeah. From which part? Uh, just like a minute ago. So yeah. I can use the combination thing, like the. That's fine. Go ahead. All right. Um, so now in 2022, there are also many developers working on tools that combine all the things that we just talked about. So. Uh, for example, SWC, which is a Rust-based compiler and bundler and minifier. And there's also ESBuild, which is a Go-based um, compiler, bundler, and minifier. So the only issue is that right now, like as I'm giving this workshop, they don't um, support as many features as Webpack does. So sometimes it's still better to use Webpack if you're using certain features that are, are needed. Um, but it's definitely nice that you know, there are so many like, developers uh, developing better tools out there, because like, adding the bundler and the compiler and the minifier always takes quite a lot of work, and it's just like a pain to set up when you just want to develop and code and like, ship your project, and you have to think about all those things. Now, there are also certain practices um, that we need to think of when we think about performance. And one of them is bundle splitting. So what we just saw is that Webpack you know, creates this one big bundle from our entry point. Uh, it contains all the code that is necessary in order to run that. But of course, a larger bundle can lead to like an increased amount of loading time, processing time, execution time, um, and yeah, like users on low-end devices, especially with like sl uh, slower networks, um, will you know will get a bad performance. Your website will load pretty slowly. Now, in order to avoid larger bundles, we can also create multiple smaller bundles. So instead of fetching everything this one big bundle at once we can just kind of split them up into multiple smaller bundles. Then there's also tree shaking. So tree shaking um, is basically like eliminating dead code. Because in many cases, like maybe we're importing something or we're creating a function, but it's not actually used anywhere. It's just kind of there, but it's, n it's n not referenced at all. Um, for example, like here we have an input, and we have the validate input, and then we also have the format. But here you see that we're only importing the validate input. So this one is never used, never ref referenced in our ap application whatsoever. Now normally, like, we could just like bundle this in that bundle, but this would just add to the bundle size, which is bad. 
So instead, a bundler usually takes care of automatically also eliminating that code that we're not using, which is called tree shaking. This is a bit tricky to do. Um, so it's not always like perfect, um, but it definitely tries to eliminate as much code that we don't need from the, from the end bundle. I guess, which is shown here. So yeah, it just removes that. There is no reference here to format input at all. It's only the validate input. So these are just some things to keep in mind when we're talking about performance patterns. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. <laughs> OK, I had a couple. Um, one about tree shaking. Um, does it make a difference? Uh, I don't know if maybe it's really a tree shaking question, but to do like destructured imports like for React, for example, instead of doing like import React in every file, you just import like the things you need. Yeah. Does that help? minimize the tree shaking, or is it like those things reference other things behind the scenes? So, so I believe it, well, it, it kind of depends on how the library author structured the okay. module. Um, it used <laughs> to be the case that, um, yeah, whenever you imported like import React from React uh, would include more code than, for example, import like use state from React. But the way it works now is that they've like restructured it so that when you're like only using React that use state, it will make sure to not include everything else. Um, but this is also part of your um, configuration for your bundler. Uh, sometimes you can also just turn it off and be like, just include everything. And in some cases, you have files that, for example, have uh, side effects. For example, when you just import a large file, the bundler cannot always know, like, I don't know if you're going to use this. Um, so just to make sure that it's not eliminating code that you might actually end up using, it will still include that. So there are just many things that are kind of like, not insecure, but it's kind of like it doesn't always know what to do. Your bundler doesn't want to make too many assumptions and maybe you know break your code. Um, so that's kind of why I said like tree shaking. It is very good right now. It's in a much better state, but it's still not as perfect as it can be or as many people expect. But okay. we're only getting better. But uh, yeah, like I said, this also really depends on how you structure your own code. So it's definitely <laughs> not just the bundler's fault. It's just sometimes kind of tricky to make sure that you're also optimizing your code to make it as tree shakeable as possible. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of cases, this really only is kind of important for library authors. OK. Um, and then I did have one question about bundle splitting as well. Um, so when you're bundling, you're like following this chain to like of all of your imports. When you're bundle splitting, is it like undoing that in any sense? Or is it something like very, very different? No, it's something different. And we're kind of going to talk about this later on as well. Okay. Um, but with bundle splitting, we can essentially say like, these parts of the application are just kind of like standalone parts. Like they don't necessarily rely on each other, although they can. Like a bundle can require another bundle if they have to, um, but it doesn't like create a bundle and then like split it. It just like outputs multiple bundles from like multiple entries. If that makes sense. Um, oh. So yeah, you're not just like bundling your entire application into one big bundle. It's just kind of splitting it based on components. For for example, on components or maybe on pages, just parts of your application. Is there any difference between bundle splitting and code splitting, or are those interchangeable? Terms? I believe they're interchangeable. But I may be wrong, but I believe they're interchangeable, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Sure. So when you work in a large organization, like you, you have a boilerplate code um, that comes with a Webpack, uh, Babel, and everything. Yeah. As a normal day-to-day -day developer, um, are these things are different than uh, like what comes with the boilerplate code? Or do you need to enable those features, or is it? Um, I mean, it you can like if you see that you know you, you're working with a code base and it doesn't have all the performance features enabled that maybe Webpack now provides. Like I don't know if you're using maybe Webpack four and you can maybe like upgrade to Webpack five and have like more features. Like it, it it's definitely worth it to see the plugins that are out there, because you know Webpack has like plugins and presets or stuff like that. So you can kind of like customize your bundling based on that. But working with Webpack is difficult. Like it is so tricky, especially like you said in like larger code bases. Um, so I think if you're working, you know, on a larger code base, I would say it's definitely worth it to see like, okay, what does the Webpack config currently look like? Uh, can it add more optimizations, like maybe minimizing? Um, Preloading, yeah, we'll see that later. But um, I think it's more important, like maybe if you start a new project or something, that you might consider using the latest Webpack or maybe using one of those combination tools to make it even faster, like SOB series build. Um, I feel like that didn't really answer your question, but I hope it makes sense. Like I know that if you're working in like a larger organization, it's a pain to change your Webpack config. Um, 
So yeah, don't don't break anything. But <laughs> yeah. One follow-up question. Sure. So in in your mind, what defines a larger bundle? And uh, is it like uh, the, the performance of loading, or is it the size of that bundle? Or so it's the size of the bundle, but that also, in almost all cases, affects loading time as well. Um, like. Um, when you're actually outputting with Webpack, they usually have like those little colors, and they actually tell you like, "Hey, this bundle is like when it's red because it's like too big, which might affect your performance." I cannot really show that right now. I won't go like too deep into Webpack, by the way, because it's so like precise that I feel like there's another front-end master's workshop on that. But um, it, yeah, a larger bundle size is over a certain am amount of bytes. I'm not entirely sure. Like, it's different for everyone. I'm not entirely sure how much that is, but I know that also Webpack tells you like, maybe consider code splitting this bundle because it's really large. Um, and we will talk about like the static imports and dynamic imports with which you can actually create those smaller bundles. Um, yeah, uh, so a larger bundle is just a large bundle that also then in turn affects the loading time, download time, parsing time, execution time, stuff like that. So, yeah. So the first thing is the static import, which I'm sure that most of us have used multiple times. So that is just using, for example, the import keyword, so import this module from that module. Um, now, what happens is when the, the module one, import module two, execute module two, import module three, execute module three. Um, now, yeah, this is, this is the, the exact same that we saw before. So when a bundler has that index.js as the entry file, it will bundle all of these together. And this makes sense because we're using all of these modules, so it can tree shake anything. It didn't have to. Um, so it's, it's outputting this bundle. Now, I'm not really going deep into the implementation here. I feel like this is pretty straightforward. Now, the trade-offs of like, using a static import is that um, the components are, of course, instantly available to the user. Like If they're included in the bundle when a user requests it, they can instantly see it. Um, there's also some optimization uh, benefits here, because like statically important modules can be analyzed and true shaken by the bundler pretty, quick or pretty easily. But like we said before, it can also end up in a large bundle size. It may include components that aren't really necessary, uh, but they're still part of your bundle. So in that case, we can maybe use something like a dynamic import. Um, so just to show you an example, for example, we again have this uh, search bar. And only when a user clicks on it, we want to show that list. So that list isn't really necessary for the initial load, because it will only ever render it when a user clicks on it. Now, if we were just statically import it, this uh, search input or this flyout, it would have been included in the bundle for essentially no reason. Maybe the user never clicks on it, right? Um, now, of course, this is a very small example, but just as an example. So instead, what we could have done is dynamically loading this component. And when we're doing that, we're just telling the bundle, like, hey, this component is on its own. So it maybe can be in its own little bundle. So it can be um, split out of that b larger bundle and put into its own bundle. Many, many bundle words here. But so here we have like a, a static import and then a dynamic import. So here we see that we're splitting that search pop-up bundle, um, which is here, this component, from the big bundle. So we can reduce the bundle size by lazy loading the search bar pop-up. And we can do this with a built-in component in React called React Suspense. Um, so we don't have to touch Webpack here at all, which is super nice. It automatically will like create this separate bundle for us. Um, and as it's loading this, so only when a user um, actually needs it, or um, when we're like actually rendering the component, so when it's open, will it fetch that bundle and render it. Uh, in the in the meantime, like while it's fetching it, we of course don't want to just like show something random. It will show this fallback component. Um, let me just show you an example. Oh yeah, so for example, here I'm just going to open this in Stack Blitz. I'm going to leave this one. So what I have here is I have multiple cards. Uh, I don't know what messages are there. So in here I. I'm statically importing card one and card two, but I'm um, dynamically importing card three and card four with a lazy uh, method that's available on React. Now I'm adding this Webpack chunk name. Um, I will show you in a second why it's just like a nice thing. But now what we can do is click here to dynamically import the card three component. So what I have here is I have a suspense, which we imported from React. And whenever this um, this card is open, so whenever we click on it, which is here, like on click toggle, then it's open, and then this component will render. And only then will it fetch that bundle for that component. 
So I can hear it like dynamically rendered at 345.3, while whereas these were rendered at 344. Um, same work for card four. Now you can see that if we go into the bigger one, I'm just going to go to the network request. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. When we're dynamically importing it, you can see that it's now fetching that card three bundle and here card four bundle. So it's only fetching that bundle when we actually request it, when the user actually needs to see it. So that initial bundle can be a lot smaller. Now, these, um, this is called a magic comment, the Webpack chunk name. Uh, it just uh, makes it possible to see like the card three dot bundle and card four dot bundle. Because like when we remove that, you will just see. I can just show you what it shows instead. Um, so this is just for kind of like developer experience. I'll just reload this. It'll just show the zero dot bundle and like zero dot one. It's not always like super obvious what is actually loading there. So I like to use these um, magic comments to uh, change the name of our bundles. But yeah, so this is already a really good way. So dynamically importing uh, components is a really nice way to reduce that initial bundle size and only fetch the bundle when the user actually needs it. Yeah, so the trade-offs here, of course, is the faster initial load. Um, this ensures that we can you know, have, have that smaller initial bundle. However, it can also lead to a layout shift. Now, layout shift is like, for example, here, uh, if this component didn't match this component, which it kind of doesn't, it can lead to like a weird layout shift. Um, that's not great. It's just a bad like, user experience. Um, and then also, um, if you're la lazy loading a component and that component actually ends up pre being like pretty large, like maybe this card four bundle is like another large bundle because somehow we didn't code split that one. Um, the user clicked on something and like it takes a while. Maybe they're on like slow internet or something. It takes a while to fetch it to render it, and their user's like, I don't see anything. I don't know what's going on. So just something to to think of to think about. But normally you kind of want to lazy load those smaller components that just aren't like instantly visible on the initial render. Now another like type of dynamic import is so this uh, what, what we just saw with like clicking on the cards is kind of called like import on user interaction, import on interaction. But we also have import on visibility. Um, this is really nice. For example, if we wanted to show all those listings on a smaller viewport, and of course this is again like a, a small example, uh, but we are rendering those listings that aren't um, directly uh, in the viewport. So instead we might like lazy load those listings, and in the meantime, we like to show a fallback. I know this is a really bad animation, but anyway, like only when the user actually sees it in their viewport will we render that bundle. So instead of having like an on click, we kind of have like a, if it's in the viewport. Now, a really nice or a really easy way to do that is by using the like intersection observer API. But then an even easier way is to use the re the hook that they also provide with the React intersection observer. So we can just use a simple hook called like use in view which returns a, a ref, like a reference, and then in view. So we can say, like, OK, if this component with that ref is in the view, then show that listing. Um, now, I just, like again, have this example just with the cards. Let's see if I can open this. On, well, I feel like if I open it in Stackblitz, it'll be in the viewport. So I'm just going to keep this a bit small. Well, OK, yeah. So here we can see that we statically import it. Actually, I'm just going to show you the code real quick. Sorry about that. Uh, ignore this for now. Oh, sorry about that. Maybe don't ignore it. Well, um, so we have this card one, card two, which we uh, statically import it, and then we also have the card three and card four, which we dynamically uh, import it. And we are using this dynamic card, and we're using like the ref in view. So here we see like scroll down because it just had to be in the viewport, not immediately. <laughs> so here we see dynamically import it at three forty eight uh, fifty six, and here it is at forty nine. Uh, oh one, so wait, I'm just going to open this so you can like just see the network request. I guess. Uh, I wonder if I can just open this in a new window. Here, inspect. Come on. Oh. Okay. Weird. Anyways, so it's basically the same as what we saw with the dynamic import on click, but this time it'll fetch the bundle automatically what's in the viewport. Now, of course, we, we from a React perspective, we implemented this the exact same way, but instead of being like open, we just had an in view that was returned from uh, this use in view hook. But this is often also used um, when you have maybe a large list or just many components that are normally outside of the view uh, or it's out of like the initial viewport. Um, it's a nice way to import them on visibility, not necessarily on like user interaction. 
uh, it, it's like the same like trade-offs that we saw with the uh, with the dynamic import, but this time a user may not like be expecting to see something, so you don't really have that like oh what's that? like I'm clicked on something why can't I see a component because it's like on visibility it doesn't require user interaction, but it's still not great like it can still lead to like layout shift and stuff like that, but definitely worth it for the faster initial load in most cases. Then we also have the route based splitting. Um, now, for example, I'm not entirely sure what this animation is going to show you. Oh, yeah. So um, we can have a separate bundle per page. For example, if we no normally with like an SPA, we have one large bundle that contains the code for everything. And although this does um, give you really fast navigation, what we can do instead is have a bundle per page. So when a user here requests the about page or navigates to the about page, it fetches this bundle, and then it'll render the about page. Um, this is also a great way to you know, have that smaller initial bundle so we only render what is necessary for the current navigation. Um, maybe if you're, I don't know if you're using React Router, but um, they provide a pretty easy way to uh, implement it. I feel like this is, this is the updated um, syntax. I'm just going to open this real quick. So here you can see that we are uh, importing those pages, those routes. And in the um, router, the React router, we're saying that the element is just a React suspense, like we saw before. And then we're rendering this component. So again, from a React perspective, it's basically the exact same thing. But when we are, I'm just going to show you the network request again. But this time, the code for the about and contact page is not included in the initial bundle based on their route. So I can do like about and contact. Now, in this case, I didn't use the, the magic comment, so they're just called like one bundle, two bundle. But yeah, so these are the bundles that are just necessary for this page. Like here you see pages contact, and here you see like pages about. So this is also a very nice way to make sure that we're only like fetching the minimal necessary code. Any questions so far on like splitting, bundle splitting based on certain events? No? Perfect. Well, then I feel like we're at the last one, which is browser hints. Um, OK. So the first browser hint, or a, a browser hint is like a hint that the browser uh, uses in order to, um, or th that we can use to tell the browser, like, hey, these resources are important. Make sure to fetch these maybe before um, the user requested it or something, just to have that faster like navigation or faster load. So one of them is prefetch. Um, and a prefetch is. Um, an attribute that we can use to fetch those resources in the background uh, and cache them. So whenever a user actually requests them, we can just quickly get it from cache instead of having to make a request all the way to the server. Um, so the browser will prefetch a resource whenever the browser is idle. And it's also calculated that it's got enough bandwidth to, to actually prefetch that, sor that um, resource. So um, for example, I think I'm showing it here. Um, oh yeah, so if, if we have that route-based splitting, and we've seen maybe from our analytics that most of our users, after going to the website, are going to the About page. I don't know, maybe there's just something trendy there. Um, so although we don't want to uh, like have that in our initial bundle, we can still prefetch it. So when the browser is idle, has the resources to do that, um, it will cache it. So when the user then actually clicks on it, it can just quickly get it from cache, and we don't have to go all the way to the server. Now, of course, this is just based on the route-based splitting example that we saw before. But prefetching could be for anything, maybe images that will show up a bit later, like below the fold, uh, or any components, like maybe that the search input component that we saw before. If we know that most users will click there, even though it's still its own bundle, we can just prefetch that to make sure it's already cached. Um, yeah, so we can either use that with just an HTML uh, prefetch, or in Webpack, we can actually use another me magic comment called Webpack prefetch. And what it, this does is like when it bundles the code, it will just um, create a link like this with that prefetch. Um, I guess I'm showing showing that here. Let's see if that works, though. <laughs> I haven't tested these examples. I'm just going to open this real quick. And then I'm going to reload it. I believe this is the about page, or one of them is the about page. But yeah, it will like prefetch it. Um, yeah, anyway, okay, I didn't test this one. But so, um, like, whenever you want to prefetch a resource, you can just use that um, Webpack magic comment. Webpack knows what to do with it, and then it'll 
um, make sure that it transposes something like like this, or it, it will bundle that bundle with that rel prefetch attribute. Um, now, yeah, so the, the trade-offs are pretty good because like if we have a resource that should be prefetched, we can um, del deliver a very fast loading time because that request doesn't have to go all the way to our server, get this giant bundle. Instead, um, they could just get it from cache. But of course, we have to make sure that we only prefetch the resources that are actually required because we don't want to unnecessarily like fetch all this data, use our user's bandwidth to fetch the data and then cache it if they never end up using it. So don't use this everywhere, just use this uh, for the resources that are likely to be requested soon. Now the next one is preload. And this one is a bit more aggressive than prefetch. Um, because a prefe with a prefetch, like the browser will be like, okay, do I have enough bandwidth? Am I idle? Like, can I request this? But with a preload, it will download the resource. It will get it. And this is, um, oh yeah, actually your browser will, at least Chrome will show you uh, a warning, be like, hey, you preloaded this resource, but it wasn't visible in the viewport within three seconds. Like, you should not be preloading this because it wasn't that important. Um, but for example, if for some reason we wanted to have our landing page and the search flyout was always open, um, yeah, so it wasn't like based on a user click. It was just like always there. But it still should be its own bundle. In that case, we could like preload that. And even though in this animation it's pretty pretty slow, of course, like this will happen super fast. So in that case, this um, bundle request will be in parallel with the main bundle request. So when it's fetching the main bundle, it'll uh, use it. It will cache it and then instantly use that bundle as well. Um, yeah, so the implementation is pretty similar. So you can, instead of using prefetch, you can use preload. Uh, and also use a Webpack uh, magic comment with Webpack preload instead of prefetch. This is only after Webpack 4.3, I believe. Before that, you had to use some plugin, some preload plugin. Um, but yeah, so like a, a preload you will often use for maybe images that are instantly available, like a banner image that might usually take a while to like fetch. Uh, but we can preload it to make sure that that has already been fetched or font, stuff like that. Just anything that's important on the initial render. Um, but yeah, of course, like the, the performance here, um, it, it's just important to make sure that you're only preloading pre pre the stuff that is, that's actually necessary. All right. Lots to take in, but that was the last thing uh, for the performance patterns. Now, maybe they will make a bit more sense when we talk about rendering patterns, but if there are any questions so far, let me know. <laughs> All right. In that case, should I just move on to rendering patterns, or should, do you want to take a break? One more um, quick question. Yeah, I think we're over an hour, so we have to take a break. But she has a question. Um, for the browser hints, the implementation examples you showed with the link, uh, like you already know the the bundle name. Um, yeah. I guess, like, would you normally, if you're using like Webpack as a bundle, would you just do like the magic comments? Exactly. To get that? Okay. I mean, like in this case, if we're also using, you know, the magic comment with the chunk name, we we do know the bundle name. But in most cases, okay. you don't. Um, or yeah, you're not going to add this chunk name for like all of these bundles. So yeah, in most cases, you would just use like these magic comments okay. so to let Webpack automatically do that. Okay. But not if you're using like images or something. You know, like if you mm. if you know your banner image, you want to prefetch or preload that, actually, uh, or font stuff like that. So okay. yeah. Cool, thanks. Sure. All right. Um, we'll just take a five minute break. People, vegetable eggs, whatever. OK, last, we have rendering patterns. Because um, yeah, render, we can render content in a lot of different ways nowadays. And knowing how and where to fetch certain data um, is key to your, your application's performance. Now, maybe you're using a framework or some other library, or maybe just React standalone. Um, but they often all use different patterns, like client-side rendering, static rendering. Um, maybe even incremental static regeneration, uh, server-side rendering, and so on. 
Now, I'm not here to like, you know, talk about which pattern is the best, which is the worst. Um, they all have like trade-offs, best use cases, and so on. Now, before we start talking about the different rendering patterns, um, something to keep in mind is the web vitals. And this is like a set of useful measurements that Chrome provides and also uses in their search index um, to measure how well your website performs and like how your users experience it. Um, now, a subset of that is called your core web vitals. So here, for example, we have the time to first byte. So that's how long it takes when a user requests your website for your server to respond with the data. So before your the browser gets like the first byte in order to like parse, execute all that stuff. Then we also have the first contentful paint. So whenever your user actually sees something useful to the screen for the first time. Then we also have the largest contentful paint. So like the largest component has loaded, maybe like a big image or any large component. Uh, and then also time to interactive, which is like the time it takes um, before your user can actually like click on your components and it actually does something. Uh, cumulative layout shift, like we saw before, like a layout shift is just annoying for your users. We don't want to load a website and then stuff randomly like renders in. Uh, you've probably experienced it. It's a very frustrating experience. Uh, and then there's also first input delay, um, which is the time for like when the user interacts with the page and when the event handlers are actually able to to run. Now we will be covering a couple terms. Um, Compiling, like we saw before, the execution time, uh, hydration, which is attaching like event, uh, and this will be more clear later on, but it's like attaching the handlers to those static DOM nodes when they're just HTML and they don't, they're not interactive yet. Um, idle, like the browser's state when it's like not doing anything, you know, like the browser's idle, it will prefetch certain resources. Um, main thread parsing processing, this will all make sense later. Well, you're, if you've used React, you're probably familiar with client side rendering. Before, uh, I just wanted to mention, we do have a full course on web performance, which covers all those metrics in detail. Perfect. Well, I'll just be quick then. Right. Or, uh, yeah. Um, so the first thing when you are you know, working with React that you're definitely familiar with is client-site rendering. So with client-site rendering, essentially what happens is your user makes a request to your server, which responds with like bare bones HTML. Browser parses this HTML, which contains nothing. Then your client requests and downloads the script, and then it will actually execute this, which dynamically appends all those elements. So only then will your user actually see stuff rendered to the screen. Um, so all the rendering happens in the browser. So now a very like most basic implementation is of course like having this like root here, and then maybe a bundle JS, and this bundle contains I don't know a DOM manipulation. But when you're working with React, like if we go to any of I mean, I, I won't go to, but if we go to, to any of the other exercises, you will see that the initial load will just contain like that ID root, like just empty HTML. And as the bundle comes in, it automatically like, appends all those dumb nodes when the user, uh, and that, that's when the user is actually able to see things. So from a performance perspective, um, client site rendering returns in a pretty fast time to first byte. Because the time to first byte is the time it takes before the browser has the first byte of that initial response. But that is just like the small HTML, nothing in it yet. It's just like that ID root. So that's pretty good. However, when it does that, it still needs to fetch the bundle before the user is actually able to see anything and in interact with anything. So with client-side rendering, what could happen if, if your bundle is pretty big, like the, the, which is why bundle splitting is so important, is that the first contentful paint, the largest contentful paints, and of course also the time to interactive, because it also binds those event uh, handlers to all those components, can be pretty long, or like a user can wait a long time. Um, However, client-side rendering is definitely useful if your content should be interactive like instantly. Because what it does is you know, it parses the data, it renders it, and also automatically binds those event listeners to them uh, right away, Yeah, which is what it says here, like the interactivity. But then the bundle size um, is also not super SEO friendly. Um, because like when uh, a, a crawler is like crawling your website, it might take a while to actually fetch that bundle too long, and it actually won't like um, crawl it. So instead, what we might want to use is static rendering. So with static rendering, what happens is, I'm just going to go up all the way, is that we, uh, or the, the HTML contents, the contents of our page are already pre-generated at build time. So um, in that case, the client can like request the HTML from the server, and it can instantly like show something. Because the HTML, instead of just having that like root, it already contains all the elements that we eventually want to show. Now, of course, this is just HTML. It's not like interactive yet. And that's why the uh, client then also still has to request a bundle. But this bundle doesn't contain you know, all those like DOM, um, like append child methods. It just contains like those hydration elements, so binding those event listeners to that static HTML. Um, 
Of course, like a bare minimum for like a static rendered application is just to have listings. Um, but like w when you're just using React normally out of the box, it will always default to client side rendering. But maybe if you're using a framework like Next.js, uh, it's super easy to cl to um, statically render. Let's see if this one is using. Yeah, so this example here is using Next.js. Um, I know a lot of frameworks also include static rendering, but this was just the easiest one to use. Um, so here you can see that, uh, let's see if we're actually using it. Uh, by default, it will actually uh, opt to uh, static rendering just because it has so many performance benefits. So when we go into the network here, inspect. I'm just going to reload this. You can see that it already contains like all this HTML that we're eventually showing here. And it didn't have that when uh, I'm just, I'll try to find maybe the, um, these exercises here, then you might see the difference. Because this is a client site rendered app. Now I should have used the listing. I could have used the listings as well. But here what you see is when we initially load it, it contains like nothing. It just has, well, OK, I'm also using Stecklets now, so it's adding like a bunch of other stuff. But the HTML itself on that initial quest is empty, whereas here it already contains the data that the browser needs to render. Now, of course, it doesn't have like the CSS yet because it's just HTML. It still needs to make that trip to fetch the CSS and uh, then also fetch the bundle to hydrate them. But static rendering, uh, let me see, it just comes with so many benefits because, let me, where was I? I think it was here. Um, because yeah, the, the time to first byte can be still be very fast, because like we just have the HTML file. And in a lot of cases, because it's just like static content, we can easily cache it on like a CDN. So the user doesn't always have to make that request to the server. We can just cache that static page um, to near to our users or close to our users on like the edge or any CDN close to the user. But of course, like what does happen is that we have to make an additional additional request to fetch that bundle. So even though the user sees content rendered to the screen, like they think it's interactive, they don't think about that. Uh, or like people don't think about like, OK, I cannot click on this yet because the bundle hasn't fetched. Well, maybe just developers think about that. Um, but because it still needs to make that request to fetch the bundle and then attach those uh, event, or, uh, event handlers, which is the hydration part. Um, so yeah. and. It, it's still like it, it can be very good depending on like the page that you have, um, yeah. So let's see where I was going with this. But in a lot of cases, the the stuff that we just saw was like with not dynamic data, but you can still statically render also with dynamic data. And there are a few approaches. So when you're using Next, you can use something called like get static props, and this method runs like at build time. So when we're building our application, so before we deploy it, we build it. It will actually fetch this data and then inject that data into the HTML that eventually we like uh, push to our servers um, and the CDN. So here I actually created a quick example showing this. And I know there are more frameworks that use you know, like a, an approach like this. It's just one way to render content. So we have like the get static props. This one fetches these listings at build time, which then um, automatically passes these props to the, to the app. Uh, which can like statically render these listings. So from a user perspective, we end up with the exact same uh, output because the generated HTML um, is again like this this uh, the HTML that we saw before. So it already contains the the listings that will eventually render. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the exact same. It's just different from a, a developer perspective. So like the trade-offs are the exact same. Um, but imagine like calling this method every time for like a lot of pages, because like in Next.js you can just have those uh, automatic pages here if we have like the page folder. Uh, also includes like route-based splitting by default. Um, but if you want to like pre-generate a lot of pages, it might take a while. Like maybe this fetch call takes like three seconds to finish. If that all runs sequentially, our build may end up being like 45 minutes if we want to pre-render lots of pages, maybe like an e-commerce website or a blog, stuff like that. Um, and also, in order, like if we deployed this website and we wanted to update this data, we'd have to redeploy the entire website in order to update that data. So that's not, that's not great. Now, of course, one thing we can do here is to um, fetch this, the dynamic data client side. So we've, we render everything else statically. And then we just um, render like the listings once the user can actually see something. So in the meantime, we'll just render like a skeleton UI or something. 
Um, so it fetches this data, and only then will it show the listings. And of course, there's also the step with like adding the event listeners and so on. Um, I won't really go too much into the implementation then, but for example, here we're also using the SWR like we saw before. So we can like fetch APIs or we can fetch the listings from the API, and while it's loading, we'll just show a skeleton, uh, and otherwise we'll just show the the listings. So in that case, we again have a good time to first byte. Same with any statically rendered uh, application. We also have a good first contentful paint because the first contentful paint is essentially the view that we see. Um, let's see here. This is the, this could be the first contentful paint, but the largest contentful paint doesn't happen until the listings are in the viewport. So even though we have a good first contentful paint, in that case, the largest contentful paint still has to wait for all those uh, for the listings to be fetched and then rendered. Um, this may also end up in like higher server costs because you know we are calling the data on every page request, and it could um, also result in, in layout shift. Maybe if the skeleton components here don't uh, match like the, the the listings here, but yeah. Now another thing you could do um, now in with Vercel or with Nexus we call it incremental static regeneration, but there are frameworks that have other approaches with kind of like a still while revalidate approach, um, and this is also to kind of add this dynamic data. So we can opt into only pre-render a subset of all the pages and render everything else on demand. So let's say we have we know we have like a thousand listings. We only want to make sure that we pre-render the latest 20 listings that are maybe like visible instantly to the user and that the user is likely to click, but everything else will be generated on demand. Um, so in that case, um, the statically generated um, page, when, when a user requests uh, a page that hasn't been generated yet, can still be cached by a CDN because it's static. So it's really only like the first user that requests those pages that haven't been generated yet uh, that might experience you know like a, a worse performance. But everything else, um, everyone else can still experience from this cache or um, benefit from this cache response. And then also we have the still while we validate. So we can automatically invalidate the cache of this static page after a certain time. So like if a user requests a stale page, so it has been cached for longer than we showed, it will automatically regenerate that in the background and replace the cache. So a user will initially see the stale content, but the next time they request it, they automatically see this new data because the, the get static props method again ran in the background in in Next.js's case in a serverless function, but it could also be in your server. Um, so this is also a great way to have this dynamic data, maybe based on a certain interval. Uh, and to make sure that your users are still able to see something uh, because there's always a cached response. I won't really go too much into the implementation of, um, of this one just because this is so Nexia specific and it's more about you know, the, the possibilities with static rendering and how you could possibly add dynamic data. Now, the other very popular pattern is server-side rendering. So with server-side rendering, we generate the HTML, so all the HTML on the server or a serverless function on every request. So the user requests the page, we just generate it, and we show it to them right away. Uh, and then, of course, we have to create an, or uh, make an additional request to fetch the bundle to hydrate those static HTML elements. And this is a great way if the page that you're rendering is highly dynamic or just contains any data that is re um, within that request, maybe like a user cookie, um, I don't know, maybe based on like authentication states. But in general, you probably want to avoid server-side rendering because, as you can see, the page still had to be generated while the user requests it. And this could take a while. Um, so it's still great for you know, those dynamic pages. But for just a normal standalone uh, application, you might not need it. Um, so in React, we can actually implement server-side rendering with, like, for example, a render to string and then the hydrate root uh, on the client. So it gets that, it get, makes a DOM tree, and it then hydrates it. Hydrating, like adding those event listeners. Um, again, I won't really, yeah. So with Next, we can uh, use server side rendering with instead of using get static props, we can just use get server side props, and this will automatically server render this page. Um, so for example, here, um, if I go in here. Now, from a user perspective, this won't be that much different compared to static rendering because the return HTML is the exact same as we saw before. However, this HTML is generated on demand on the server instead of pre-generated at build time, um, maybe on like your, your own device on some build server. Now, 
the performance versus server-side rendering and static rendering look pretty similar, but the biggest difference here is the time to first byte because it can take a while from when the user requests it to when the server can actually respond with the data that it still has to generate. So when the time to first byte is slow, the user just looks at like a blank page, which is not great. You, you probably want to avoid that. Um, but it's still great for you know, having those very personalized pages or any page that's render blocking, really, because we can just say, like, you don't have the right cookie, you don't have the right authentication state, I don't want to render this page. Um, and another like downside to server set rendering is if you're using like a server or a lambda and your server goes down or your region goes down, so does your website because there is usually not a cached version unless you add like a cache control. Um, but in most cases, when you use SSR, you don't want to use cache control because there shouldn't be a cached version because it's personalized on every request or it should be. That's like the best case uh, or best use case for server rendering. Um, so that's definitely a downside. It's just like more to to maintain. Now, currently, a lot of people are also exploring with streaming server-side rendering. So the biggest difference here is with normal SSR, we had to create the entire HTML and fetch the entire bundle uh, and parse this bundle before any hydration could begin. You know, We had to uh, wait for all the components to be ready before any component could be ready, really. But with ser uh, streaming server rendering, the components uh, get streamed as soon as they're generated on the server. So we see like it can be generated in smaller parts. And also, something called progressively hydrated. So whereas normal hydration, we had to wait for the entire bundle to be ready, parsed, before the entire tree was hydrated. With progressive hydration, we can actually say, like, OK, just hydrate this component, just hydrate that component as soon as it's ready. Um, so this is also um, like th this is great for performance, as we can instantly show our users, like, OK, this smaller components are ready, so show them. Don't wait for these larger components to, to generate on the server, because that could end up in a bad time to first byte. So the performance here it looks um, interesting. So we have, like, as it's streamed down, we don't really have, like, one big, um, I guess the blue was, wait, I just got to make sure that. I guess that is like parsing HTML. Yeah, so here it like parses the HTML, layout paints, and parses it again, layout paint, because it's like constantly getting it. It's like a stream, um, which is great for like, as you can see, the time to first byte is extremely fast because like the smallest component can stream as soon as it's ready. And also the first contentful paint can be really fast because the first comp component can already render and can be interactive if it's, um, it uses uh, progressive rehydration. The largest contentful paint is still the same as with normal server site rendering in most cases. Uh, because we still have to wait for that entire component to be generated um, and then rendered, hydrated, all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's also great for the network back pressure. Um, and the only downside is that the HTTP streaming is not supported on like all runtimes yet. So in some cases, I, I believe that Lambda doesn't support it. I may be wrong here, um, but maybe you are you've. Uh, deployed your server rendered app somewhere in a in a runtime that does support streaming SSR in that case you can't use it. Um, but yeah, that's really the only downside. Now I didn't cover this here, but with the new React server components, this is actually a big part of that. Um, because streaming SSR kind of allows us to have a partially like statically generated page and then partially SSR page because we can SSR certain components instead of like the entire page like we saw before. So we can static render the static parts of our page, which is great for performance, and then only server render like any components that need that server-specific data. Um, so that's very exciting. Anyways, I kind of flew through the rendering patterns here, but in case you have any questions, let me know. And otherwise, I just want to point that I know I've covered a lot of patterns here. However, if you want to read more, then make sure to check out patterns.dev. Because um, we have a lot more patterns here, like uh, stuff that we that I wasn't able to cover today, um, like mixin pattern, mediator, middleware. Um, what else didn't I cover? Flyweight, I guess. Uh, and also, yeah, it goes it goes all the way down. Um, and then there's also Addy's uh, original book, uh, Learning JavaScript Design Patterns, and I believe he updated it to the ES15 syntax. So this is also covering a lot of the original patterns. Um, or like based on the original book with the updated syntax uh, in case you, uh, you want to learn more about JavaScript patterns. Someone wants to know how you created all those awesome animations. Keynote. <laughs> Keynote. Yeah.
rendering patterns. <laughs> it was helpful, but it was also fast and a lot of new information for me. Do you have any other resources you would recommend? So I actually have a blog on this, or it's called a talks, re talks rendering patterns. Um, now this one doesn't cover client site rendering. Um, don't watch this talk. It was really bad, but anyway, <laughs> 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 it was so bad. Um, no, but in this on this blog, I also. Um, have everything about static rendering and then also server rendering. And I also included, um, let me just go down a bit, um, the edge rendering side that I wasn't able to cover here. Um, so serverless, and then we have edge server side rendering. And now I have to say, because this was also a talk for Vercel, a lot of this is kind of focused on like what Vercel uh, mm -hmm. uses out of the box. But by all means, like this is, I see a lot of frameworks move to like this edge SSR right now, just because it comes with so many benefits. Um, so it will definitely be like the future of rendering. Like I feel like talking about rendering patterns will be outdated in three years from now. Everyone will just like use one optimized pattern and be like, why did we even have to think about this? <laughs> like, I may be wrong, but um, yeah, especially with like React server components and uh, the new edge runtime stuff like that. It's uh, it's exciting. I like it. Will only get better. The web gets so much better. It also mentioned in the intermediate React course, Ryan Holt kind of covers some of these topics, shows you how to do server side rendering and that kind of thing. Yeah. Could you um, clarify again the distinctions between static rendering and server side rendering? Yeah. I know so you kind of talked about that, but for sure. No. So so it's ser or the biggest difference is that with static rendering. The HTML gets generated at build time. So, like, if I deploy my website right now, it would get built. So, it generates the HTML on my computer, and then I can deploy it to any server. And like, what I deploy is already that like complete HTML. But with server-side rendering, um, that HTML that normally I would have built like on my computer it will get generated on the server when a user requests it. If that makes sense. So, instead of already having that HTML file ready for the user as they request it, it still needs to be generated like on demand. Um, which is the biggest difference. But they both kind of return the same result. They both return static HTML. Uh, but when it's generated is the biggest difference here. If that clears things up. <laughs> Another good course to check out would be uh, Scott Moss's XJS course. Oh, yeah, I had an XJS course, right? About. Yeah. Um, I won't have, obviously, the streaming SSR stuff. Probably good. It's still in beta, <laughs> so the API changes, I guess, probably. But is, is there a way to measure the current performance uh, rendering uh, with uh, with the browsers? Um, you mean like Lighthouse? Are you aware of Lighthouse? Yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah. So you can use, uh, for example, for this one. Okay, I'm probably gonna bet get a really bad performance. Not like right as I talked about <laughs> getting a good performance. Uh, no. So we can, for example, here generate a report. I'm just going to do it on desktop. Generate a report. Um, now it's auditing me, or my website. Um, let's see. It comes up with like fun tips. Uh, average user device costs less than 200 US dollars. They just show this to be like, look, you really need to optimize your website because a lot of people have pretty bad phones. So it takes a long time to load that website. I don't know why this is taking me so long, by the way. Normally, this doesn't take this long. I feel like I know there's also something like a real web curve test or something. I'm not. I think maybe it's this web one. Web page test the ORI. Right? And then uh, web.dev allows you to kind of do this lighthouse. Yeah, so I can start a test here. So, oh yeah, it just showed you. It, it runs on like a really bad phone right now. Um, mm -hmm. So this is going to be. But uh, yeah, you can also go to web.dev, and that's basically lighthouse. Yeah. I don't know what this is. This this never takes this long. <laughs> OK. Under measure. Oh. oh, yeah. I always forget and where things are. It's basically a hosted version of mm -hmm. Lighthouse. Because it returns the same results. OK, I'm just going to close that one. Maybe that will speed things up a bit. Shouldn't, but do I have Wi-Fi? Yeah, I do. <laughs> OK, well, here you see that it measured the first contentful paint. It measured the, the time to interactive, total blocking time, cumulative layout shift, all that stuff. Um, 
Now it also shows some nice opportunities, stuff that I haven't covered yet, like serve images in next-gen formats. For example, here I'm using PNG. Maybe I wanted to use like WebP, um, I don't know, other, other type of better formats that make it. Um, it. It actually also shows you how Next.js is doing it, which is pretty nice. Because yeah, with, if you're using Next, it actually comes with image optimization by default, which is pretty nice. Um, so yeah, it, it shows you all these things. Also, other stuff that I haven't talked about, like not about performance, but about like accessibility. Um, for example, my buttons don't have like an accessible name, so this can be diff or difficult, like these screen readers, uh, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, if you're ever if you ever wonder how well your website's performing, make sure to uh, use a tool like this. Let's see if I can also run it on like a desktop. No, I guess I can't change it here. But yeah, there are, there are many ways to measure your performance, and you can actually see if the changes that you made uh, had any impact on your app's performance. Can you explain a little more about like static rendering, where you fetch dynamic data on the client side versus server side rendering? Yeah. Like, are they fairly similar, or? No. So what I was trying to, and I can, I guess, show you the thing here. I think this was the dynamic one. Let me let me just check real quick. Um, so I have the components. I have the listings. So I'm actually using. Let's see. Yeah, so since I'm using Next.js, this will automatically, it's called like automatic static optimization. So any page that we build is static by default. So I am showing these listings, but then these listings themselves use the use listings hook. So what happens is, let me see if, I feel like the network might be so fast that you cannot really see the difference. I feel like I, I ended up in an infinite loop there. Wait, that's always a fun thing with hooks, isn't it? Let's see. Oh, because I didn't. OK. OK. So let's see what the initial HTML contains. If we can see that. Now, this has like a lot of extra data just because um, stack blitz. Actually, let's see. Is this using? Okay, and stack list makes this like hard because it adds so many other things. But no, th so th there's a big difference between this and server-side rendering. So what I wanted to show here is that the entire page still gets statically generated. Um, so if I wanted to maybe show like um, a, a title here, like um, H1 welcome, whatever, um, this would still all be um, generated. Uh, at build time. The only difference here is that within listings, which will also get generated at build time, but initially it will just only render this uh, p loading component because this listings is false at build time. You know, it's not going to fetch from a React hook at build time. It doesn't run um, the hooks. So the initial HTML that got returned to the client just has this p loading. So it's it's not that it doesn't have anything. Um, and then on demand, like when it actually does have listings, um, the so in the example I showed here, just a quick, the, the P loading would have been like a skeleton component. So maybe instead of like loading here, it would have been like skeleton UI. I don't know. Um, so that skeleton UI component will, would be generated or turned to HTML, and that would get built at build time and then deployed. Um, and then only once the use listings hook has fetched data will it actually return those other uh, grids, or the, the listings grid, sorry. Which on like server side, it would it's making the API call on the server instead of. Well, it's it's fetching the data for the listings on the server, yeah. but it's not generating HTML on the server. It's generating the HTML on the clients. Or, um, yeah, it's, it's it's rendering those listings on the clients. Um, so with server site rendering, the entire HTML gets generated on the client from like the HTML body head 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 like everything gets generated on the client. Whereas here with um, static rendering and a client side fetch, we still have a lot of components that have been pre built. It's really just in this case, any dynamic components that need that data, they will be generated uh, on the client, like dynamically. Hope that makes sense.
I don't know if there are any more questions from like online or if I should just end it. <laughs> uh, just like claps and stuff. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate that. Anyways, thank you all so much for coming to this workshop. I uh, appreciated it. Appreciated your presence here. I hope it was uh, useful in a bit. Um, yeah, of course, make sure to check out JavaScript patterns at Versailles app or just patterns.dev where we have so many more patterns to, uh, to show you. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Can I just unplug these things? Or? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I won't. Um, if you need to do other stuff, we can turn the TV off, but we'll need to re-record a couple of things. Okay, sure. <laughs>